Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to the opening drive on 101 ESPN with Brooke Grimsley and Super Bowl champ Kerry Davis. I'm Randy Carricker. Matthew Rocky is also here, and we're looking forward to a great day of radio for you. Morning, kids. How are we doing? Doing well. Good. Happy Friday. Yes. It, oh, is. it is. Everybody, every everybody Friday is, is really a happy it is. Friday. I don't, I don't know that anyone has a bad Friday, so to speak. Oh, it's, some people do. We got a guy that uh, right off the bat uh, <laughs> texted in at 6.53 said, do you guys not read text at all anymore? You have three hours. Well, first of all, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't even on the radio to say, to, to read your text. And yes, so you texted in seven minutes ahead of time. Thank you for that. And we already read one of your texts at 314-399-9646, 314-399-YOHO. We're on the YouTube. You can see us there. Just go to YouTube.com. Type in 101 ESPN STL and you'll be able to see our face. And we're just going to have a glorious time this morning. Uh, Matthew, you got all those Cardinal highlights ready? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Ain't going to be. Who, yeah. Got them all ready to go. Okay, good. Uh, how many of them are there? <laughs> That's, a personal, full, huh? that's a personal opinion, Kerry. Yeah. All right. Uh, Cardinals head, head into their final weekend of the 2024, thankfully. <laughs> 2023 season. Yeah. Uh, I've already yeah. got us finished in last place in 2024. That's bad. That's not positive. But anyway, it's the last... Uh, it's the last weekend of a last place season. And on a happier note, we celebrate the great career of Adam Wainwright this weekend. That's the biggest thing, right? Yes. That's, that's at least something to look forward to this weekend is Wayno Palooza. Because, uh-huh. you know, we had Randy Palooza. I feel like Wayno Palooza is very a good way to describe what we'll see this weekend. He's going to have a concert on Saturday. I'm going to go to that game as a fan mm-hmm. and then on Sunday go as a media member. But I want to see the concert on Saturday, so that'll be fun. But other than that, uh... uh Cardinals had six hits yesterday. Yeah. Nice. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. How many runs? Oh, well, let's, let's count them up here on... Uh, <laughs> None, Carrie. <laughs> that kind of matters. None. It's like a Randy character algebra test in high school. <laughs> you, you can't win if you don't score no, any. No, they didn't have anybody with more than uh, one hit. That sucks. Um, your, your lineup yesterday is exactly as you expected it would be on September 28th. At the beginning of the season, you figured it would be Newt Barr, Edmund Walker, Luke Home Run Baker, Palacios, Yepes, Kisner, Cuericudo, and win. That's that's what we all anticipated for the yes, fourth the last game of the season. I wasn't expecting. Yeah, I, I'm glad we didn't play the lineup game yesterday because oh. there's no way I would have been able to guess. Yeah, we, we <laughs> all might that. have gotten the. Well, we would have had trouble with JW at number three, right? Probably. Yeah. I mean, I. I, if you know who else is playing or isn't playing, maybe it becomes a little bit easier. Maybe that's let's see where he's batting at next season. I'm I'm, I'm intrigued. Hey, what do we I have to too. talk about this year? Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> okay. Well, let's talk about other teams. Can we talk about last year? Because around this last time year? last year, we're about oh, we're 300, oh, 300 no. some odd, 350 some odd days away from what took place. Last yeah. year, Kerry, yeah. uh, that's... I, I can tell you that it was about this time last year <laughs> that I said on these very airwaves. The only end National League team in the playoffs that doesn't have a chance to go to the World Series is the Philadelphia yeah, Phillies. That's the, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> I said that. Yeah. I, I get it, CD, because you would rather look at the past where there was at least some more recent exciting times, or you would rather look at the future. You don't want to be in the present right now because the Cardinals, what are they at now? A season low 21 games below 500. I kind of like 20 90 better. losses. Yeah, the first time that they've lost 90 games in a season since 1990. So seeing that all over social media, it's like you couldn't escape it last night. Well, at least they didn't get to 100. Yeah, well, and don't you appreciate the consistency, though? <laughs> so, it's, you know, like we were, we're all so proud of Stan Musial having 1,865 hits at home, 1,865 hits on the road. Yeah. Aren't you pleased with the fact that they have 45 losses at home and 45 losses nah, on the road? no. Not really. The level of consistency is pretty dramatic. Nah, I don't no. I don't think that's the consistency we're okay. looking for. So the Reds are in town over the weekend. By the way, there are some great uh, playoff races going on. The American League, you've got three teams for two spots. Tampa Bay is going to be one playoff or one wild card team. They've clinched it. You've got Toronto, a game ahead of Houston. Houston, a game of, ahead of Seattle. Heading into the final weekend. You have three teams for two spots in the American League, and the National League is even crazier. You've got Philadelphia in, Arizona pretty much in. They're a game and a half up on Miami. But then for one spot, you've got Miami a half game ahead of the Cubs and a game and a half ahead of the Reds. So the Reds will be motivated heading into tonight's game at the very least. And uh, 
unfortunately, uh, for the Cubs, sitting there a half game out, uh, they they need to have a good weekend. They, they just got swept by Atlanta. Mm. So those sorts of things happen. Those so, Braves are really good. Yeah, they, they really are. Yeah. So maybe we it's good to not be a playoff team this year anyway. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's ever good to not be in the playoffs. Because you can't win a championship if you're not in the playoffs. I was looking for the net positive here. Okay. All right. Mm. Uh, you're, you're sunshine lollipops. Yeah, I get it. Kind of, yeah. Uh, the Brewers did beat the Cardinals yesterday by a score of 3-0. Blackhawks beat the Blues last night 2-1 in overtime. Connor Bedard, I told you somebody needed to run him last night. He had a couple of assists. <laughs> I, I'm not allowed anymore to put bounties on Blackhawks players. That's been established. But Sprung at some point, point, somebody somewhere has to get that guy. Yeah, that's uh, that was my biggest takeaway from last night is uh, he's going to be bothersome yeah. for many, many, many years to come. Yeah, he'll be a problem. Yeah. So hmm. uh, Robert Thomas, who restarts his weekly hit with us next week, gets the one goal for the note. Uh, Pavel Butchnevich on the assist. What day is uh, Robert Thomas going to join us or is he going to do we know? Is he going to be floating? That's, yeah, again? that's movable. OK, good. Because I was thinking this morning with uh, Wednesdays with Wayno ending, we should just put Michelle Smallman in that slot on every Wednesday. Just have her where Wayno was because okay. her show ends at 9 o'clock, St. Louis time up in New York. And we want to talk to Michelle all the time anyway. She's not talking on her own show. So, um... <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we're going to have Michelle on every week. And last night, the Lions drubbed the Packers 34-20. to Now, the Packers are not good this week, this year, and their offensive line is decimated, and they've got a young quarterback. There's a lot of stuff going on. But, but, the Lions are legit. Lions yes, are good. They are. They, they, they look really good. They have a team that uh, they ran the ball really well last night. David Montgomery did. Uh, Jared Goff, I said it yesterday, he's a quarterback that has taken a team to the Super Bowl, and, and he just kind of continuously gets looked over. Everyone thought that Jordan Love would come in home game Thursday night. You know, he's the guy. But Jordan J, um, Goff just goes out and does his job every single day. And, and the, the Detroit Lions are a really good football team. I need to see more from them. I know they had a really big win in week one, which mm -hmm. was fantastic against the Chiefs in Kansas City. But I need to see a little bit more, see a few more teams that they face. I'll have a better idea who they are week eight, week nine, and, and really know. But... I think they are, without doubt, the front runner in the NFC uh, North. What did you think about Jordan Love's performance on the Packers side? I thought he, he's a young quarterback. Yeah. And so you, you, I know there are high expectations from him. I think I was a little bit frustrated, a little bit bothered that the fans booed the Packers <laughs> yeah. on their way off of the field. He, he's in his fourth year, Jordan Love is, but really this is his really first year of game after game experience where teams are are scouting against him and knowing what he can or cannot do he's going to have some lumps he's going to have some times where it's not looking really really good so i don't think it's terrible i, I don't look at him as a fourth year quarterback i look yeah. at him as a as, as a first year maybe second year at most mm -hmm. quarterback still learning the game on the fly i like that they let him you know get mobile a little bit i feel like that's what you want to see from him and i didn't know where that game was going to go in the first three minutes with jared goff <laughs> yeah, throwing that interception yeah. i thought that was big for the line to be able to I, at least show that they could really stabilize things after that. By the way, do you guys, uh, the, the U-Cord Cutters, do you really like it when the picture gets pixelated? And yeah. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> no. Is that, is that, are you trying to get people to get cable back? No, I, I is just, that I, your I, ploy I, to get a, I, to I am back? such a fan of a quality picture and quality audio that I will never cut the cord. It's it's not worth it to me to have the low quality costs, picture and sound. Costs too much money. Though. I don't care. There's a lot of it's starting to get the same with so many streaming options. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. by the end you of the day, you're paying just as much. And with this, I mean, everybody has Amazon anyway, so everybody's got Amazon Prime, so it doesn't really matter. Right. But you're right, Brooke. We're going to have playoff games on Peacock. Yeah. Uh, there, You've got games on Apple, right, mm -hmm. or whatever. You Well, the NFL Sunday tickets on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So there's Randomly so many. Randomly, Hulu gets stuff every right. once in a while yeah. for whatever I, reason. I think Hulu's <laughs> going to have... This weekend, the Europe game is going to be a Disney game. It's going to be Toy Story, and I yeah. think that's going to be on Hulu. Yeah. So yeah, it's but ultimately they did that with a hockey game last year, Big City Greens. I thought yeah. it was really cool. This will be fun. It, it's cool that they do that. I think it gets kids uh, engaged and wanting to watch it because I turned it on for them and I'm like, oh, my kids love cool. Big City yeah. Greens. Okay, <laughs> check this going on here. Yeah. I love the creativity, and yeah. it's a great way to cultivate a younger fan base. The average NFL fan is 50, so you might as well get. I, I think my I became an NFL fan 
fan when I was six. Mm. So, and I was until really 2016. Uh, how about you guys? When did you become, how old were you when you became NFL fans? I remember watching football probably around the same age, just Monday night, just watching games. And I remember Flipper Anderson. And I, I just uh-huh. remember watching guys when I was really, really young. And I was a fan of the of the uh, 49ers in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And so that was my team, watching, watching those guys play football. I can remember probably like six or seven. And it was such a great time in Tennessee with the Titans, obviously with Eddie George and Steve McNair. I remember that we even wrote in first grade when we were learning to write, we wrote letters to Steve McNair to practice (laughs) and my dad was a super fan so if you remember like back when the Titans fans would do like the flame heads and then Mm -hmm. like the face pan all that stuff I would remember him doing that like every Sunday so very vivid memories and Hmm. that was such a great time Steve McNair and Eddie George I mean my god that was just such fantastic football seeing that and it's so cool that you guys have a team because it's a shame that the league literally yes. disenfranchised three markets in San Diego, Oakland, and St. Louis. And mm-hmm. these young people that uh, they, they, they'll still become fans, but they they won't have the emotional attachment of actually being able to go to a game. Mizzou plays at Vanderbilt tomorrow. Both Brady Cook and Luther Burden are questionable for that game. Starts at three o'clock on SEC Network. And uh, Lindenwood is in action tomorrow as well. They take on Austin P. What does what do the fans say? Let's go P. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's their saying. <laughs> it's, they're the governors, of course, but uh, their saying is "Let's go pee." That's actually my parents' alma mater, where they met. So, uh, that yeah, is nice. in so Clarksville, cool. Tennessee. Clarksville. Clarksville. Uh, there you go. There you, you go. Clarksville. You're a true Tennessee over there. Thank you. Well, Clarksville. You don't say Ville. Yeah, Clarksville. Clarksville. Clarksville and our fighting Tennessee. Illini are at Purdue tomorrow. That's a two thirty game on Peacock. It's going to be an interesting game. Uh, Ryan Walters, former mm-hmm. former defensive coordinator for the Illini, head coach, current head coach of Purdue. Uh, he's he's probably want to, he wants to get at the old Illini a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. So big day of college football tomorrow. Big day of the NFL on Sunday. As a matter of fact, Sunday, you've got Browns and Ravens at noon here on 101 ESPN. Then you've got Chargers and Raiders at 305. And then the Sunday night game, the Jets at, or the Jets take on the Chiefs, MetLife Stadium, Taylor Swift, on hand. All right, we're off and running here on 101 ESPN at 712. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. We mentioned Linda Wood back at home finally tomorrow, and we're going to talk to their head coach, Jed Stugart, coming up next on 101 ESPN. Tomorrow, college football is on.
It's Hall of Fame weekend at Lindenwood as they host Austin P tomorrow. And one of the players that is going into the Lindenwood Hall of Fame this weekend is former NFL running back D.D. Dorsey. Of course, Pierre Desir played in the NFL, a member of Kerry Davis' staff. Brian Schaefering also from Lindenwood played in the National Football League. And so it'll be quite a weekend at Lindenwood. We welcome to the conversation the head coach at Lindenwood, Jed Stugart. Good morning, sir. How you doing? Good morning, and we got to talk a little bit about our, our reigning uh, NFL player, John Harris, with the Denver Broncos. I know that's a tough subject right now, talking mm. about Broncos defense, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, just just uh, forget about, don't forget about John. It's been been pretty proud of John Harris. He's been playing there uh, starting the last three games, so. Been pretty exciting. Lindenwood with a, a great history and more to come. And Austin P tomorrow. And nice for you guys, I'm sure, just to be back home. Well, it's been a three week uh, grind a little bit. You know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know that in my career, I don't think I've ever, I, I don't remember ever playing three road games in a row, you know. So, uh, you know, that was part of the, that was part of the scheduling challenges, you know, when, uh, when we moved up to Division One. <clears throat> so many of these, um, you know, some of these schedules were set, and so you had to kind of get the games where you could get the games. But you know what? I thought our guys actually handled it um, pretty well. Um, you know, but it does it does kind of take a toll a little bit. But uh, we didn't really bring attention to it. We never talked about it, and uh, and it's no excuse, you know, for anything. It's just uh, it'll be nice to be back home finally. Coach, you and Randy just named some names of some guys that had a great career at Lindenwood, have gone on to have great careers in the NFL. When you're recruiting, how difficult is it to recruit but also prepare for a regular season game during the season? Well, you know, especially when they moved up the signing date, you know, I think, um, you know, that was something that was really uh, uh, important. And, uh it, you know, for for recruiting, it used to be kind of February is when you sign, and you'd have some time after the season to really kind of get a push, you know. But like this weekend, you know, we have Hall of Fame weekend, but we also have an official visit going on, so we've got some recruits coming in, and we got forty kids coming in, uh, twenty five kids, you know, for high school or for game day visits. So, you know, th- it has definitely changed when it comes to preparing for a football game managing a football game, but also, um, you know, putting on a a recruiting weekend for your next class. So, um, you know, it's good. Uh, Early signing days are good, uh, but it does, it does kind of double up the time that you got to do. So it is, it is challenging, Gary. It's, it's something where you got to stay on top of it. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but it's good. It's good to have them be able to come experience game days so they can really see what the total atmosphere is like. Coach, it was a tough loss for you guys this past weekend against Illinois State. What was your biggest takeaway from that loss? You know, Brady, we're finding out the same deal as we did, you know, two weeks ago. We, you know, we had a good win uh, the week before. The week before that, you know, uh, we went back and watched film. And, and right now, probably the frustrating thing is, you know, you look at the scores, but then you go watch the film on Sunday and, and you sit there and you see, you know, the matter of seven or eight plays that really – make a big difference and there there's seven or eight plays that we can uh, that, that we can take care of you know so it's it's you know it's one of those things where you know if we're just kind of doing our jobs and we're not giving up a big play because we you know maybe misfit here or, or maybe we drop a you know a, a simple first down um, catch you know that extends the chains um, or we don't uh, you know we don't turn a ball over and over something that's controllable you know um, so so that's the thing that's kind of frustrating, you know, because we feel like, you know, we were within six points of that team. And then, you know, about three bad things happen. And then when that happens, you got to try to just keep keep uh, everybody kind of believing again. And, and so, um, and that's going to happen. We're, we're a very young football team, and we know that. But they've got to grow up fast here. You know, we, we, we're learning. But we just got to put, uh, we got to put four quarters together because we, we'll have these little strings of quarters where we, we play really well. And uh, the nice thing about these guys is they're they're highly coachable. They care. I don't see any discouragement. You know, they had a good week of practice, um, and uh, and we're going to face another good football team Saturday. And I'm I'm really excited to see. That's what we challenge our guys this week: is how do you respond 
and, and we get to see that uh, tomorrow. Judge Stugart, the head coach at Lindenwood with us on 101 ESPN. And speaking of responding, you have a running back named Robert Giamo who got hurt last year, only played a couple of games, got hurt in the, the second game of the season. And he's back this year, had a good game last week. And I would think, Jed, as a coach, and Kerry sees the same thing with his kids, when you have a kid bounce back after what could have been a debilitating football injury, that really has to be heartening to see him come back and be as effective as Robert has been so far. Well, it speaks to his work ethic and his drive because you're exactly right. That that injury he had, I mean, you hear, you know, foot injuries can be really scary. You know, he had six bones that were broken his foot. You know, it's sometimes, you know, somebody might break a bone. You know, he had six of them broke. Um, the recovery was very hard. Um, it took a long time. And uh, but when you watch his work ethic, when you kind of just see his drive, um, you know, it, it, it didn't surprise me because, you know, that was a very challenging uh, injury. And, and the hard part about that was just the rehab. But, uh, you know, Robert's one of those guys that you almost have to and you don't uh, you don't have this very often. You almost have to tell a kid in practice to tone it down. You know, usually we're trying to get guys that, hey, you, we can get more of you out of practice, you know. Uh, Robert, every day in practice, you know, every run that he takes, he he, he takes it for a touchdown. So, um, you know, he's a finisher, and that's what he's been instilled in him. And, and so, uh, you know, sometimes you have to kind of almost bring him back sometimes uh, because he's he's just so wired to work. And so a uh, great leader on our team and, and a great example of work ethic for the rest of our guys. So um, got a bunch of young kids watching him practice every day that's always making them better as well. Coach, I want to go back briefly to the Illinois State game. You all were only down 20 to 14 at halftime. So going into half, you really had the confidence. But as you said, it didn't turn out the way you wanted to. How do you get them to stay dialed in and locked in like they were in the first half to make sure that that second half doesn't go uh, haywire in the manner that, that it did? Well, and, and a lot of that is overcoming, you know, the mental part of it of not feeling like, okay, here it goes again. You know, we had a, you know, uh, you know, and it wasn't, uh, you know, you're going to get some calls. You're not going to get some calls. You know, we, we were, um, you know, we threw a, you know, potential touchdown in, in the end zone. You know, we felt like, you know, it, uh, um, you know, our quarterback or our tight end, you know, kind of, kind of a bang, bang play. It could have been one of those things, but all of a sudden that could have, uh, really put us in a whole different position, but then we ended up settling for a field goal there. And, you know, when we get, you know, we kind of feel a little bit like, uh, you know, shoot, we didn't get the touchdown. And so, um, you know, and then you can't, you know, we go down and, and that's when we had a, a turnover, um, you know, heading back down um, when, on a, when we're driving again. And, and that turned into another touchdown for them. And, you know, it's, again, it's one of those things where you take, you go look at those seven or eight plays. So, you know, I think psychologically and in practice is just kind of keep reminding the guys about uh, the great things they've done in football games, the, the comebacks that they've done. You know, we've even, re we've even reminded them of last year, you know, of, of we've got enough guys on this team that played last year that had these upset wins, um, you know, and came from behind or, or, you know, started off fast in the second half. So a lot of psychology going on right now just to kind of get them back to remembering, you know, that they're a good football team. We just got to put it all together. You guys will be facing Austin P this weekend for the first time in program history. You guys are both two and two going into this one. What is the expectation about facing the governors? Well, I mean, we got to, uh, you know, number one, you know, we got to uh, – you know, defensively, we got to kind of match up with, uh, you know, they've got some, they spread you out like crazy. They they like to get the ball out quick to receivers on the perimeter with a lot of screen game, which means you got to, uh, you know, it's a lot of athletes out there. You got to make tackles, um, you know, and I think, you know, defensively, you know, they do a lot of stuff. They're a 3-3 three, three stack defense, likes to move around. Uh, but, you know, I think our, you know, we got to be patient with our run game. You know, I think it's one of the things that we, have been able to run the ball. He spoke about Giamo. He's been, I think he had 100 yards last week against a pretty good defense. In fact, a really good defense last week. So, you know, we're, uh, again, you know, just like we knew this year is going to be, every every opponent that we play is, is going to be, uh, has been an established Division One FCS program for a long time. We have to start matching that. Uh, the kids know what to expect. They know what the guys are going to look like they're playing against. And, and so it's not new for them. We just got to go out and, and, and execute.
Uh, Coach, finally, Carrie and I are trying to recruit Brooke, whose parents went to Austin P. Uh, Carrie and I obviously are on the side of the Lions here. So. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, of course I'm going to cheer you on, oh, Coach. There we there go. go. How about yes. that? <laughs> that was quick, wasn't it? <laughs> well, but, Brooke, the little-known secret, clear back in 2015, I actually – I actually was out there. I was a finalist for that job, um, so I was looking at. But when they kept saying, when I kept seeing that their their little chant was "Let's go pee," yes. <laughs> I just wasn't sure I could really uh, go with that. Whole time, so. I, I told but them that, that today, that, and they didn't believe me at first. Oh, no, it's a real deal. Oh. It's a real deal. So, so, but, uh, yeah, so it'll be it'll be a fun uh, game. It's always again. This is going to be another a year where. It is exciting to play somebody new a lot. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, it's just, it's a new experience. You never know. You don't know. We both haven't played each other before. So it creates a lot of excitement. And I think our kids are used to playing, uh, you know, kid, you know, teams for the first time. So this is another opportunity. Jed, we'll see you tomorrow before the game. And then we'll see you at the Hall of Fame ceremony tomorrow night. Sounds great. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day. Thank you. That is Jed Stugart, the head football coach at Lindenwood University. Tickets available tomorrow, by the way, over at Harland uh, uh, Stadium, Harland C. Hunter Stadium. And uh, you should check out the St. Louis Division I team, the Lindenwood Lions. Coming up, I'm going to talk a little Ryder Cup. Now, things not off to a great start for the USA in the Ryder Cup. We're going to talk to new Missouri State Hall of Famer, Jay Delsing, next on 101 ESPN.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals last night blanked by the Brewers, three to nothing. Dakota Hudson in the start, five innings pitch, seven hits, three earned runs, three walks, and three strikeouts. Cardinals start their final series of the season tonight, 7:15 first pitch against the Reds. It'll be Brandon Williamson, the lefty for the Reds, facing off against Jake Woodford for the Cardinals. Woodford on the season, two and two with a 5.09 ERA through 46 innings pitched so far. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your road and shop 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? I'm Randy Carricker. It's the opening drive on 101 ESPN, and we go to the celebrity line. Our buddy Jay Delsing, Golf with Jay Delsing, Sunday mornings 8 to 10 here on 101 ESPN, is now a member of the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. We congratulate you on being named last week. We were remiss in not naming it last week, but congratulations, brother. How you doing? Oh, thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate it. I, I I thought it was my brother punking me when I got this phone call from someplace in Missouri, and I was like, "You got it, it was it was a, what a thrill!" And, and I'm so uh, so honored. Well, we're glad that you were happy then, because apparently you aren't happy right now with the USA being down four nil to Europe so far in the Ryder Cup, and uh, things not looking great as they play four ball right now either. Not great, not great, guys. I feel like I've seen this movie before. These guys. The Euros come out charging, and, and we just look like a deer in headlights. We Our putters are absolutely cold, and, and they are making everything. Matthew Fitzpatrick, in his match with Rory McIlroy this morning, has made 61 feet of putts in the first four holes already. <laughs> and it, it's, just, it's just insane. I, um, yeah, we're not happy over here. And, and I've got the happiest dog in North America. i got this golden doodle Cooper that just spins around every morning, and it's is happy and I'm like Cooper come on man we're 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 four down you cannot be this happy <laughs> he just he's all about it well Jay I know that it's underway right now but what do you think of some of the pairings in the way that Johnson really uh, approached this going into the Ryder Cup I know one of the big stories was Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas together they're going right now but they set out the opening session what did you think of that strategy you know what, Brooke? It's like anything. If it works, it look he's going to look really good. And because it hasn't, he's going to get second guessed. You know, right out of the building here. Um, it, it's interesting. He starts the, the thing off with Scheffler and and Sam Burns. And again, Scotty Scheffler is world number one and a, a a great player. But these guys have not won a. I think they've won a half a point playing together four times in the in the President's Cup, and they just you know got got smoked this morning you guys we didn't win the europeans won 25 holes and we won i think 11 or something something so disproportionate it i i i i mean it it just goes back to we talked about the golf course and i i swear as a player this is so crucial these guys um robert mcintyre has won the italian open there so is nicola nikolai hoygaard all of these guys know this golf course. McElroy's finished third. Uh, Hatton's finished third. They're, they know this golf course so well. And it just comes to fruition on the greens. I mean, it's not like the U.S. is bad. Are, we're bad putters because we're not. But it's just that extra comfort in knowing, you know, what the hell the ball's going to do and having played a couple of championships there. It, it just makes a big difference. And they are whipping our ass this morning. And it, it sucks. Jay, I'm always intrigued by this because I hear basketball players say it when they play in the Olympics for the gold medal and things of that nature, that playing for your country almost feels more important than playing for your own team. Do you think that that this is more important than than when they actually are playing for their own selves and winning, trying to win their own tournaments? I think it is, Kerry, because it's, it's, it's so, so much larger. There's so much more on, it seems like there's so much more on the line. You know, when you're, when you're out there playing by yourself, and you you play 25 events a year, you're going to have four or five stinkers. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're going to go out there where you just don't have it, and, and it and it sucks, and, 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 you, and you may miss a few cuts, but you're not going to make much money, and you're not, your game's just not going to be there. And when you're playing for the, the red, white, and blue, it's, it's, it's just a, a much bigger, bigger moment. And I feel like, you know, these, these guys battle each other every single week on both sides of the – 
of the uh, of the coin here. The the euros do the same thing, but for whatever reason, it just seems like the the euros can come together in a different sense of camaraderie and pull this thing, you know, pull this thing out. It we are so far behind the eight ball here this year. Now you know, down four. I mean, it only takes fourteen and a half points to to win this thing, and 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 the way that the the the, the second session is going. You know, this afternoon over there in Rome, it, it doesn't look good at all. Hey, Jay, I want you to give us a tip on staying behind the ball. One of the biggest things that I have an issue with when I go bad, when, I, when I'm not playing well, which is, well, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but one of, the, one of the issues I have is staying behind the ball and my head moving. Do you have any tips or tricks that you use to stay behind the ball and, and generate more power? Yeah, so that's a great question, Randy, and I see it all the time. So what amateurs typically do, so you want to crush this, especially let's just talk about our tee shots. You want to try to crush this tee shot, so you're thinking, I'm going to get way behind the ball, and you, you're, the key to this whole thing is your right knee and your right hip. So when you try to load up and, and get behind the ball, most amateurs wind up swaying, and so that means there's lateral movement, and that is a killer in golf it is it'll absolutely remove you of all your power you'll hit the ball straight sideways you can hook it and slice it it's just it's just the death move and so what i try to tell folks is you really want to be firm on the inside part of your right knee so it needs to be able to kind of brace you as you turn against it so you want to feel tension in your in your right quad you want to take your right butt cheek for we're we're assuming we're right-handed golfers Mm -hmm. and you want to actually let it turn back behind you instead of let it go uh, letting it go side um letting it go laterally because that that way it creates a little tension and then so if, if you watch these guys swing this morning randy they turn so well so in order for them to get behind the ball they turn more and, and, and go circular instead of lateral. And I see all the time that the, that the um, especially guys' right knee, so I talk, talked about how crucial your right knee is. If you keep the inside part of your right knee really firm, and you'll feel it down in your foot as well, and turn against that right side, then you can go ahead and unwind and crash the ball and, and hit it much better. If you let that right knee stay loose and have it go it, it, it'll kind of wobble and it'll, it'll go actually away from the target or to your right. It, you, it, it strips you of all your power. Your body loses the, the, your lower body connection and you wind up flailing it most of the time, slicing it like hell when you do that. So it, it's remember when, I mean, Albert Pujols is probably the greatest right-handed hitter I've ever seen in my life. And I used to love watching him at his, set up and, and, and address if you would and the pitch is coming in and he just he flexes that right knee and the, his right butt cheek goes out a little bit and man when he decides he's going to try to hit something the lower body just is unleashed and the bat comes in later and it's so powerful it's just ridiculous and the golf swing's a lot like that okay ranger randy will give that a try <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that i don't know if that translates over the radio <laughs> I, I, I saw tory and uh tory rory uh, because i was out at the range a couple of days ago and i'm just so inconsistent so i i like that tip thank you very much <laughs> well here's another thing randy if you can kind of put like a, a golf ball under the back right part of your foot to keep that that'll help keep your weight on the inside part of your knee and then when you turn against it you're going to feel a lot of tension and then so consequently when you unwind you're going to feel like holy smokes this rubber band got really really tight on my backswing and then i'm as i spin to go through you're going to have a lot more power like it <laughs> jay you go crush that drive sometimes too really <laughs> i've seen you That's a, those are the days when i'm not swaying Oh, <laughs> Jay, just going back to the Ryder Cup and the foursomes that really just stuck out to me when they came out yesterday is, as you mentioned, Europe is just really throwing everything at Team USA. The pairing that really stuck out to me was Rory McIlroy and Tommy Fleetwood. I mean, that is a power duo. And do you like the nickname for him, Fleetwood Mac? Fleetwood Mac, yeah, they, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't <laughs> like anything about those guys right now. And. And Rory is one of my favorite humans. He's just a, a, a great guy. It, yeah, I mean, he, he's um, he's the heart and soul of the team. John Rahm is the emotional leader of that of that team. But R- Rory McIlroy is the hub. Everybody everybody revolves around Rory. And um, 
And he's, if you look at what the position that they put Rory in, he's anchoring everything. He's in the, the fourth uh, match. And so, I mean, to, 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 those guys are good. They're, they're good buddies and they just feed off each other. And I just, I just, I just don't know what, what it is about the U S team. I mean, we are loaded. We have a lot of really good players and to look at how few holes they won, it, it's this is exactly what the Europeans needed and exactly what we didn't want to have happen. And so I, I don't know about the strategy. You went, you asked again about the strategy of starting out with, you know, Scotty Scheffler and Sam Burns, and obviously it didn't work, so it's easy to second guess. But I I believe I would have come out with, with some, something like either Speed Thomas or, or Schaffle and um, – in Cantlay, but you know, they didn't win either. So it all comes down, Kerry, and it's as you know, just as a professional athlete, it comes down to who's who's balling. Yeah. Who's making putts? Who's executing? And if without the execution, you know, this is a this is a bad movie that we've seen before. Jay, don't say that too loud. They'll be blaming the caddy around here. You gotta it's about <laughs> the players, right? It's not about the club you get, it's about how you hit it. <laughs> Well, there is a reason we have caddies, though, Terry. We don't do a lot of things wrong. We, we, we do blame our crap. We do blame our tools. We still do. Jay, who do you have on your show on Sunday morning? We've got Shane Bacon and uh, right. Adam Betts. And, 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 yeah, Shane Bacon. Guys, Shane Bacon's written a children's book. And uh, he's he's doing some really cool stuff with logos. And, and, and Danny Mack and I got to interview this guy. And it was like... What else do you do? You know, because he's actually not on on any national uh, broadcast right now for for golf, but he's he's now an author and he's 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 started a business where he he takes people's logos and kind of spruces them up and changes them around a little bit. And then Adam Betts, who's you know down at Family Golf and Learning Center, man, the, the guys, you've got to get. And I know Brooke, you're taking lessons down there. That that place is rocking and yeah. it's just providing such a great place for people to get better at golf here in St. Louis. Perfect. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Congratulations again on the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame. We're, we're proud to have you as a friend and as a contributor to the show and as a member of the station and a member of our community. You're, you're very, very, very deserving. Oh, my gosh. I figured it was a slow day. They needed a golfer in there, Randy, so <laughs> they, they, they got me in. I really appreciate it. I, I, I love being on the show. All Thank right. you. Thank you, brother. Send me a text or a video on your swing. I will. Absolutely. I t- yeah. <laughs> you, you can get a laugh out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what you don't want to do. No, I just... <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you later, Jay. Jay Delsing yeah. with us on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we've got Take It or Leave It. That means you need to get your text in now to the Air Comfort Service text line 314-399-9646. 314-399-YOHO. Take It or Leave It coming your way next on 101 ESPN.
Don't set it right back. Get your text in test 314-399-9646. And give us your take it or leave it. Brought to you by Gloria Lou Realty. Visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com and start packing. That's my final author. Take it or leave it. Tioli on 101 ESPN. Get your text in now with Brooke and Carrie and Matthew. I'm Randy and guys last night, the Marlins for the second time in three days had an issue with the weather and the grounds crew at City Field after Jazz Chisholm and Yuri Gurriel had hit consecutive run scoring hits that put the Marlins ahead. The umpires ordered the tarp off the field and the game was suspended by rain at 12.58 a.m. after a three hour and 17 minute delay. This on the heels of the Mets grounds crew not putting the tarp on the field during the weekend and a game being postponed because of rain with no tarp on the field. Hmm. Take it or leave it. Major League Baseball does not want the Marlins in the playoffs. Oh, oh. you're saying that they created the weather situation? Uh, uh, with uh, with they, the tarp situation, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Not the weather, but how they handled the weather. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I'm going to leave it. That's the conspiracy. conspiracy theory. I know. I you don't want to put on your tinfoil hat, nah, Carrie? I just... I, <laughs> Until somebody <laughs> shows me that they are that way, then, you know. Uh, take I, it or leave it. The Mets don't want to see the Marlins oh, in the Yeah, I'll take that. I'll for take sure. That. Mets That's don't want to see conspiracy. anybody. As much money as they spend. Why they? Yeah. Don't nobody go there. <laughs> Screw <laughs> uh, So the Ra- sorry, the Broncos travel to Chicago to take on <laughs> the Bears this weekend. <laughs> the uh, Broncos gave up 70 points last week. <laughs> the Bears gave up 41 points, I believe, last week. <laughs> Uh, they had about 14 points, 20, 24 points between the two of them last week. They could believe it. No more than 20 points are scored in that game on Sunday. Ooh. By both teams? Combined. Both? I'm leaving that. I'm, I, I, I would bet under 40. But I'm you not going to bet under you 20. You think they're going to score two touchdowns and a couple of field goals? Both There's teams? There's no way. Because I think the both Browns defense. Suck. Both offenses stink as yeah, well. You're yeah. Gonna, you're going to have Justin Fields running around. He'll, he'll They'll get... Ugh. No, I'm with you, Carrie, on that one. I think this is going to be people okay, just stumbling into points. a victory. Uh, I, 17-10. That's 27. Yeah, I don't think I'm going over. I'm yeah. going 13 to 10. That's how I feel about it. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly what I think about it. I just don't. That's going to be a terrible game, right? 10 overtime, victory in in, in the field goal. Yeah, victory in overtime via field goal. (laughs) You said you wanted to draw the other day, remember? (laughs) 10 10 (laughs) draw. Zero, nil, nil draw would be my, would make my day. I would come in here so delightful if both of those offense didn't get past midfield. Uh, That'd be great. Just kick eight. Punts on each side. They should pay people to watch that game. <laughs> Anyways, uh, take it or leave it, guys. Um, of course, last night, the Blues losing to the Blackhawks, and I just couldn't help but just get really sad because there's somebody that I really miss that is now part of the Blackhawks broadcasting. Take it or leave it. Seeing Panger on the broadcast with the Blackhawks is the absolute worst, and that's nothing against Jamie Rivers. Love Jamie Rivers and everything that he's doing. I like them. I liked. I miss the whole crew back together. I know the changes happen and all that stuff, but I just hate seeing Panger with the Blackhawks. They don't deserve those nice things. They don't deserve Bedard. They don't deserve Panger. I hate it. They kind of do. No. Uh, I, I, I see where you're coming from, but I'm going to have to respectfully leave this because I saw Brett Hull don the stupid Red Wings jersey. Oh. oh. Yeah. Uh, see? Yeah. Nah. Players, yeah. That people, was the worst. people leave, huh, Randy? Yeah. They do. Albert left. Yeah. Yeah. So. Then came back. So Jimmy, Panger can come back. Jimmy Edmonds wearing the Cubs jersey. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Not great. No. This still made me sad, though. Oh, yeah, it And is I'm sad. sure he's very, very happy. Better better seems like work-life balance is yeah. what he was looking for. All right. So, Matthew, what do you got on the text line? Take it or leave it. Zach Thompson gets more than 15 starts next year for take the Cardinals. It. Take it. Leave it. Well. More than 15? Come on. I'm he, gonna he's take the fifth it. starter well, well, going well. into the season. Uh, okay. Let me just. Let me. Just, well, we got to. Uh, well, well, you know what? Take it. Some because bath. some back injuries, lat injuries. No, that's not going to happen. Shoulder yet. injuries. No, I'm talking about other people. Oh, well. Okay, so uh, in his first full season, uh, Clayton Kershaw started 31. So 
Uh, yeah. He'll... So he's he... oh, so everything's just Clayton Kershaw. So he's Clayton yeah. Kershaw. Who gets number twenty-two? Hey. By the way, do you give it to Thompson or do you give it to uh, J Dub? J Dub. Okay, yeah. that's the number you want. Because I mean, this guy's going to be the next Clayton Kershaw. Who wears twenty-two? So we got, we got, we had Lord Hannes Almighty. Wagner. We have <laughs> Willie Mays. We do. And we have Clayton Kershaw. Clayton Kershaw. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. And we're 21 <laughs> games yeah. under 500. <laughs> Come on. Really? Make it make sense. <laughs> when are they going to start playing? Honest Wagner is dead and Willie Mays is 85. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's what <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> now it makes sense. Well, yeah. Take it or leave it. Aaron Knoll is a very risky signing in this offseason. He has not been very good the last two, two of the last three years. Take it. Any pitcher is a risk. Ski off season signing. Yes, hundred yeah, yeah. yeah. percent. Trade, trade for for old Dylan Cease. I like that. I like that a lot. Well, that's, that's one the, that's of the, the three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the three. Yeah, the other two guys would be guys who are like, who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> who's this? Who's Yakub Barnes? <laughs> Take it or leave it. The Blues and the Blackhawks will renew their once heated rivalry, and things will be interesting for the next coming years. Oh, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take it if, actually. If, Baruby is going to have a team that is going to be more physical, heavier, willing to hit people and put them on the boards. I, I, I don't know that the Blackhawks will back down. Hopefully not. Hopefully yeah. they'll be up for the challenge and we can have some good, clean hockey fun. Yeah. Do that Take, hockey. Somebody just asked, do you guys ever go back and check your Tioli guesses? No, uh, we, should. No, we should not. We should. No, we shouldn't. Yeah, we should. Continue to keep the fight statistics, down. and we'll just stick with that. <laughs> <laughs> Write them down. April 4th a board? of this year is the last time a Hall of Famer got through. Didn't we have a board? What happened to the board? Didn't you have a board we used of to, uh, yeah, but then they, they and, put and put words? This beautiful new wall. We got to get a new board. Yeah, okay, we got a whiteboard in the office. Yeah, let's get a let's board and, and start okay. keeping track of our predictions. We'll put it up. It's in the office. We had... Like, uh, Michelle and I had a contest for every time somebody would say, great question. Mm. So who, who would get the points? Yeah. 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 I have a mental tally right now. Yeah. Brooke is slaughtering you guys. Oh, I know. Yeah. Uh, it's ridiculous. I don't know about that. You no, guys, you know trust what? Me. You guys all ask great questions. Thank you. There Brooke. you go. Thank yes. you, Very kind of you. Yes. It's like a way to make us feel dumb. better. Uh, take it. Take it. Stinking. Take it. You guys don't stink. I love your questions. <laughs> take it or leave it. There's no combination of three pitchers that will get the Cardinals 20 more wins next year. Leave it. Um, that's no an interesting question. No, you got to leave that. Realistic there is combination. A combination. Realistic combination. There you go. Now that yeah, is that, a great that question. Is, uh... <laughs> well, that's a great <laughs> question. Here's there. the thing. You, you, uh, just uh, let's look at it this way. This team that's in town right now, the Reds are. 81 and 78. Last year they finished 62 and 100. Mm-hmm. Things happen in baseball. Things turn around. They things do. change. Randy, uh, it's not supposed to happen here. No, it's not. But I'm That's just saying that things things can turn around in a big hurry. Just to say that it, it's a completely different year next year. It, so you just can't say, okay, add three pitches to pitchers to the staff. It's going to be a completely different team. It's it going to be. You're going to have completely different opponents mm-hmm. and. Hopefully you're healthier and you don't have the WBC and you maybe have Wilking Rodriguez. It'll be a dramatically different year. I was with you until wait a what, second. What'd you say? Who? Wilking Rodriguez. Uh, he'll be here. <laughs> Wasn't that one of the things we lost this year? Wasn't that one of the keys to the I'm honestly surprised he's it'll be a dramatically different year in twenty twenty five. Last year the oh, Orioles Wilking. went eighty three and seventy nine. This year they won hundred games. I will always look back at this year and think about what yep. if yep. with Me Wilkin too. Rodriguez. What Me if? <laughs> Take it or leave it. Klaus scores two goals tomorrow night on route to a city victory. Take it. Take it. Ooh, yeah, I would take Sam, it. Did, you text, coming to did you text that in? I did not. <laughs> okay. Because I don't think that's what's going to happen. Oh, oh well, what do you think's going to happen? I, I think, think Neil, that Neil they draw. No, no, I think they go up that early is- in the first half and he probably pulls some of the guys just to not get the, you know, just to at the 60 minute mark, he pulls Klaus and Leuven just to get other people's run, keep After other legs fresh, and keep those goals. guys fresh. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he gets two in the first. I'm going to okay. predict it a Deneron goal. How about that? Okay. I like that. I, like See, that. I, I think a Deneron and Klaus each scoring is, is, is live. We all want a reliable mechanic. <laughs> we all do. You said that yesterday, and it's like three hours later, it hit me. <laughs> And I was just like, oh, it sounds like mechanic. Uh, <laughs> that's, you said it took okay. you how long? It hit me like three, three hours three later. Hours? Like, I was, and I wasn't like listening to the audio. I was just kind of sitting back there working on stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like mechanics. Just out of nowhere. That's really good. <laughs> I, I love how your brain works. It is. It took uh, me a while. It's, it's a process. It's, it's, I said it's a process. <laughs> it was the most. It was the most like just like blase. I said mechanic like in a run of like four players' names, and Randy just goes, "Yeah, you like when he's reliable." And just like at, at that, it took me a you very were just long time. About that. I wow. just was randomly thinking about it, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> that was a good one by Randy." Thank you, Matthew. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, that is take it or leave it on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we're going to talk with our buddy Greg Amsinger of MLB Network here on the opening drive on 101 ESPN. Nobody brings you more value in fine jewelry than Diamonds Direct. And they're proving it again by rolling back interest rates to 0%. But you need to hurry. Now through Sunday only, you can make any purchase and spread your payments over five years with an unheard of interest rate of 0.0%. A $6,000 ring is just 100 bucks a month. But hurry, this radical offer ends Sunday at 5 p.m. Don't miss this once-a-year blockbuster deal. Hurry, five years, zero interest financing. Get details and more at DiamondsDirect.com. Diamonds Direct, your love, our passion. Unproved credit. Make the Goodwill choice. Donate to Goodwill and help put people to work right here in St. Louis. And help yourself to a Lion's Choice famous roast beef sandwich. Clean out those closets and cabinets. Take your donations to Goodwill during the month of September and you'll get a coupon for an original Lion's Choice roast beef sandwich courtesy of Lion's Choice. Give hope. Give local. Give Goodwill. It's the right choice for Lion's Choice. Hurry. Supplies are limited. Get details at MERSGoodwill.org. ESPN. A fresh perspective on the day's top stories. It's the opening drive's fresh take. Brought to you by Schnucks Rewards. Reward yourself. Earn 2% back on every purchase with the Schnucks Rewards app. Randy, and we go to Greg Amsinger. Greg, I want to start off with a question for you. Shoot. Go How about them Cowboys? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. I thought of your face when I saw the final, like, seconds of this game. And I was like, I, I believe Randy character and Greg Amsinger Uniting, reuniting in our big red fandom. I feel like we've changed the course of history for this franchise. And and I'm very excited about the future. And we're going to do this together, Randy. You and I, we will do this together. It's going to be spectacular. Okay, one other thing we were talking about during the break. You are sitting in that studio with an eye towards the Cardinals pretty much every night at MLB Tonight at MLB Network. You're the lead anchor there. And so you keep a close eye on the Cardinals. On a scale of 1 to 10 this season, how entertaining have the Cardinals been for you? 
Ooh, whoa. I, I mean, how do you define entertaining? <laughs> Fun to watch. Uh, okay, so you, you don't have to watch the games, but uh, let, let's just look at it this way. You're sitting, you're, you're a viewer at home, and you say, okay, I'm, I'm all in on the Cardinals, win or lose. How much fun have they been to watch? How entertaining okay. has, has this pr- product been? So, so like what I've learned uh, being in New York City for as long as I've been, that, that Yankee and Mets are actually, and this sounds weird, but they're miserable when their team is perfect. When their <laughs> team wins over 100 games, there's this hint of misery that they have, and they bring up all the negative things. This is what people in New York do that love baseball. Um, I think that's odd and weird. Um, but my friends in St. Louis, who I talk to regularly, and I, and, I, and I adore them, they're wonderful, but they really love the Cardinals. They are starting, and I don't think, I don't want to say that this is a broad stroke for everyone in St. Louis, but they're starting to morph into New York baseball fans, where I interact with them more when the Cardinals lose than when the Cardinals win. I don't hear from them when the Cardinals win, when they go to the playoffs, when they celebrate an NL Central Division title, or when they're two games away from going to the World Series unless they want tickets to the World Series. Maybe I'll hear from them then. But they love interacting about baseball when the Cardinals are a dumpster fire. And they're, those are their words. Those are their words. So I don't know. I feel like, and I'm only answering based on my instincts regarding people I talk baseball with outside of the walls of MLB Network. But I feel like it's almost like what we learned in journalism, right? When it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. It's the top story. The Cardinals have been bleeding all over the place. And people like to talk about things that upset them. So I almost feel like, in a weird way, that this season has been even more entertaining because the millions of GMs that live in St. Louis <laughs> are actually putting their cap on and they're getting to work. They're getting to work. They're solving the Cardinals problems every day at the water cooler. So it might be more entertaining than a normal winning Cardinal season. Good answer. I like it. <laughs> that is really good. So it, I, and speaking of everybody being a GM, we were kind of getting fired up on this topic yesterday. Brad Thompson mentioned on the fast lane that he thinks that there's a possibility of Wilson Contreras going into the outfield next season. What do you think about that possible decision? And is there any consequences to that? Uh, look, I, every time I see this kid Herrera hit, I, I don't care what his batting average is. I, I, I can care less. There are kids that look comfortable at the plate with a bat in their hand, and he looks that way. His minor league stats have been really impressive. Uh, and obviously his skills behind the plate, he's here to say he, he could do this. He he could be the next guy for the St. Louis Cardinals behind the plate. I think they want him to be. And I don't know why they signed Wilson Contreras. He knew this kid was a budding star in the minor leagues. But that said, Wilson Contreras has had one of his best offensive seasons of his career. And, and people need to recognize that. He has been as advertised. When this whole drama of Wilson Contreras is ruining the Cardinals because he's not Yadi or Molina was taking place, and I was telling people to stop complaining about this guy. He is what he is. He's a good player. He is a great offensive player for that position. Um, he's got an OPS over 800, and he's got to be in the middle of the order. He's got if the Cardinals going to play next year at the level they want to play. He's a guy that's going to be in the mix. I, I don't know if he can play left field. It seems like the Cardinals have a lot of outfielders already, um, and and who knows who, who's going to earn a spot. I mean, Luke and Baker's an interesting talent, and if you're looking at a conventional designated hitter as long as Goldsmith's playing first base, I, he kind of fits the 1980s mold of a Steve Balboni DH. And if you don't know who that is, go to Baseball Reference and Google it. Steve Balboni had a mustache. It was like, it was world-class baseball when guys like that played. Nickname was Bye Bye, by the way. Great na- nickname, <laughs> Bye Bye Balboni. Yeah, I mean, what happened to nicknames, by the way? Can we start coming up with more nicknames? Well, we need to improve on this, yeah. Randy, Randy, why don't you take this, like the bull by the horns here, and every day on your show, give one of the Cardinals players a new nickname and get people all into that. I'm all for nicknames. They don't see it anymore. Okay. Anyway. I, 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 I've been calling. Oh, yes. Please do. Uh, I, I've been calling Richie Palacios <laughs> Willie Mays uh, oh. to, to some disdain here in the room. Wait, wait, wait. You, you, can't, you can't nickname players. 
<laughs> Hall of Famers, you know. He, he's got a great nickname for some of the players in the bullpen. You want to tell him about those guys? Oh, so yeah. here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so when the Cardinals have a game where Drew Verhagen, Casey Lawrence, and Vic, uh, Andre Pallante all pitch, that's the Holy Trinity. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and Greg, and then when you add uh, Yakub Barnes, we call him Yakub Barnes because there's a blues player that is, his name is Jacob Barnes, but it should be Yakub. So then, Jacob uh, Verana. Yeah, yeah, Verana. And so we switch that around. You can add that in, and you have the four horsemen. There you go. Well, all right, scrap this idea. Don't get, give them any nickname. <laughs> okay. That, that was a terrible idea by me. I, I'll improve, I'll improve in my out. nickname. Don't do it anymore. Don't do it anymore, Randy. You, you don't like the Holy Trinity? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not the path I wanted to go down with the nickname. It is not. Um, but what I'm saying is, I'll answer it this way. I, I will see Contreras to got play, and I think this kid Herrera is going to play behind the plate. So you got to figure it out from that point forward. If he's a DH, he's a DH. If he's athletic enough to play left field, put him in the outfield and trade some of these outfielders mm. to, to go get Mike Trout. Oh. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> that was good. That was good. Greg, Ronald Acuna became the first player ever with 40 home runs, 70 stolen bases. Is he the leader for MVP in the NL? Is it his and, and his to lose? You know, it's funny. Uh, Matt Olson hit another home run last night. Now he officially has twice as many home runs as Freddie Freeman, who he replaced oh in God. Atlanta. <laughs> and <laughs> he's got 134. He passed Eddie Matthews for the single season RBI record in Braves history. A guy named Hank Aaron played for the Braves. Hmm. He's not even in the top two anymore. And Matt Olson might not be on the most valuable player award show that I host every year when we hand out the hardware and announce who wins the MVP. And you need to be one of the three finalists to get that honor. And it's an honor to be on that show. He might not make it. He might not be one of the three. Do I think Ronald Acuna Jr. is the most outstanding player in baseball this year in the National League? Absolutely. Will he win the MVP? He will probably win it unanimously. Mm. We've never seen 40-70. We've never seen it. But do you know what we have seen before? We have seen the Braves win the World Series without Ronald Acuna Jr. Yeah. And I went on a soapbox uh, the other day, which I do regularly, which is shocking to anybody <laughs> listening to this right now. And, and I said, I, I miss the days where there was this mystery behind who was the most valuable player. Because value, to me, should be defined by how you impacted games and or season and or pennant race when games matter the most. What is the point of playing Major League Baseball? The point isn't to put up the most impressive individual statistics. The point is to win the World Series. And whoever can do that and impact their team the most, to me, is the most valuable. And there was a day and age where writers were the gatekeepers to who these players were. Now we have social media and access on many platforms to watch your favorite player at all times. You can watch your favorite player go grocery shopping somewhere on TikTok. So we're oversaturated with all this content regarding our favorite players. We don't need writers anymore to tell us the mystery and the power behind these guys and, 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 and telling me how Larry Boa turned an incredible double play in the eighth inning of a tie game and helped the Philadelphia Phillies get a two to one win because he also laid down a sacrifice bunt to get the winning run from second to third. That was the old school days when they talked about guys that helped the team win. Now, am I saying Ronald Cunha Jr. has helped the Braves win? Absolutely. Absolutely, and he's going to win the MVP. But would the Braves have won the NL East if Ronald Acuna Jr. didn't play a single game this year? The answer is yes. That's how good their team is. That's how great they are. They would have won the NL East without him. Hmm. I miss the days, like 1984, when Ryan Samberg won the MVP and he hit 19 home runs. When Keith Hernandez finished second in 1984 and he hit 15 home runs. The guy, based on wins above replacement, that should have won the MVP that year, didn't finish in the top five in MVP voting. That was Gary Carter for the Montreal Expos. So we used to think of the MVP in a different way. We will never see a player like Ozzie Smith finish second in the most valuable player award voting ever again, which is what he did in 1987 when he didn't hit a single home run. 
when he finished ahead of his teammate, Jack Clark, who had 35 home runs. We were next level back in the day. It was a better MVP. Now it's the most outstanding player in baseball. We don't need anybody from the BBWAA to vote on this award anymore. We know who's going to win. We know who's going to finish second. We know who's going to finish third. I could cut the middleman out. I'll just announce it myself. We all know. <laughs> we all know. So to me, I want to get back to the old school days where Ozzie Smith and Larry Boa can be top three in the MVP without hitting a single home run. Unfortunately, those days are probably over. Greg, the the Braves have eight players who have played over 130 games. They have the best record in baseball. Do you think that there's some correlation there for guys playing every day and actually winning a lot of baseball games? I think there's a correlation to giving a bunch of players financial security and mm. making them feel immensely valued and not having them go on the field looking over their shoulder if they mess up. I think there's immense value in the psychology of commitment. Hey, Orlando Arcia, we know we have this kid named Vaughn Grissom who everyone thinks should be the shortstop since we didn't bring back Dansby Swanson. But all of the veterans on this team seem to love you, and you're not 35 years old. You're still in your late 20s. So we're going to commit to you. You're going to be our starting shortstop. No, no, Vaughn Grissom, we'll keep him in the minor leagues. We'll bring him up in September. Uh, he'll play around. We don't care. Vaughn Grissom could hit 351, which, by the way, he tore up minor league baseball. We might trade Vaughn Grissom, but we're going to commit to you. Matter of fact, here's a couple of your contracts. Contract. Matter of fact, go get him. Oh, you're the starting shortstop in the, in the All-Star game for the National League? Holy smokes, that's crazy how that happened. Because they committed to it. And he could have an 0 for 21 slump. It's who the starting shortstop is for the Atlanta Braves. It's Orlando Arcia. These are the things the Braves have done. The psychology of commitment is an amazing thing in sports. And it, the polar opposite of that is the musical chairs of the St. Louis Cardinals outfield, and no one can get their footing, and no one can feel like they're a central figure to where the Cardinals are going. So uh, the psychology of that uh, is the Atlanta Braves, and I think they've done a remarkable job. And Alex Anthopoulos has had to make some very difficult decisions, letting Freddie Freeman go and bringing a guy in while Freddie was still a free agent and crying on national TV on during every interview about how much he loved playing for the Braves. That made Alex Anthopoulos public enemy number one in Atlanta, and it paid off because Matt Olson, who should be in the top three for NL MVP because he does the one thing that is the most valuable in all of baseball, which is score yourself. If you can score yourself, more than anybody, you should be in the top three of MVP, and he's done that 54 times. So uh, the Braves are, to me, the absolute definition of a great baseball team, top to bottom. Greg, we could do this for an hour, but I, I only have a couple of minutes, <laughs> and I want to give you the opportunity to explain, in your opinion, what you think the legacy of Adam Wainwright is here in St. Louis. Oh, man. I, I mean, just a multi-layered class act in, in every way. I got to tell you, I've done a lot of great shows in my in my career where I feel like we walk up the set and and we were part of the of the the, 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 the storytelling of a magical night of sports. Uh, game one sixty two in two thousand eleven really comes to mind. So many people watched that night because we could bounce around to all the different games that mattered. And, and uh, that night, Adam Wainwright went out for the last time. Uh, we were there from the beginning to the end on MLB Tonight going back and forth, and Dan Plesak pitched 18 years in the big leagues, and last night was his uh, anniversary of his last performance 20 years ago at the mm -hmm. vet to get the last out at the old vet in Philadelphia. He was on the, uh, on the set that night. It was his best broadcast he's ever had. As Adam Wainwright warmed up before the second inning, now we have access to ballpark cameras in the dugout and in center field, so we're showing Adam Wainwright warming up, and Dan Plesak goes, Greg, if he gets his 200th win tonight, he's never thrown a baseball again. This is on live TV. He goes, it looks like an injured position player is warming up in between innings. Greg, I don't know what's wrong with him, but that is the, that is the look of a man who's pitching through severe pain. And I was blown away that he just said he never goes that hard. He's not a he's not a hot take artist like some of us are. He knows pitching. He loves pitching. And he said that he is out there with smoke and mirrors. He's trying to he's trying to trick him tonight. He has nothing left in that right elbow and shoulder. There's nothing left in there. And to watch him grit it out 
the way Adam Wainwright did. He is what every Cardinal fan loves, and that is a guy who leads it all on the field. He might have 60% of what he normally had in his career, but guess what? He's given everything he's got to the St. Louis Cardinal baseball fans, and that's what that's what they ask for in St. Louis. He is the definition of what they want to see. Was he getting rocked every fifth day for the majority of this year? Yep. But did Cardinal fans believe he was giving everything he had? Yep, and they knew it. That is what a first-class athlete is to St. Louis fans who want to see first-class athletes. And it doesn't get better than Adam Wainwright. Awesome. Great stuff. Uh, uh, Greg, we're so excited about the playoffs starting next week on Tuesday. And uh, I'm sure that we'll be texting over the course of the weekend. And uh, go Big Red. Yeah, yeah, and no more nicknames. You guys can take a pause on that. Oh, you've you done enough. We were, we were liking the Holy Trinity. We were, we were actually enjoying it. I'm next, sorry. Next Thursday, <laughs> the Cardinal season will have come to an end, but a Cardinal that will be here in 2024, we will have a spectacular lo- – it won't be like a J-Dub nickname, to Jordan Walker. I'm going to have a spectacular, long-standing nickname for one of the young Cardinals for you next week. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to that. If we could keep it on the positive side, Randy, that would be even better. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, how could you get more positive than the Holy Trinity? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Have a great oh, weekend. Randy. Have a great weekend, brother. <laughs> yeah, guys. See ya. Greg Amsinger, MLB Network on, on 101 ESPN. Huh. It might be sacrilegious. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, can there really be a trap game for Missouri's football program? That's next on 101 ESPN.
feed the Tigers on the opening drive. This is the Morning Zoo. 101 ESPN. Brought to you by James Carlton of State Farm. Mention Mizzou to James when you request a quote, and he will donate $20 to Mizzou's preferred NIL on your behalf. CarltonInsurance.net. Missouri is 4-0. They're ranked 23rd in the country, and they take on Vanderbilt tomorrow. And a lot of folks wondering, could this be a trap game for Mizzou with LSU on the horizon? And with all due respect to the University of Missouri's football program, and I love it, I'm a fan, but I don't think Missouri is good enough to think of another team as being worthy of overlooking. I right. I just don't, especially now you're playing an SEC team. It, I don't care that it's Vanderbilt. It's an SEC team. You cannot think that there's going to be a walkover if you're the University of Missouri. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an SEC team on the road. Uh, a team, as you said, in the break, Randy, they're, they're averaging 358 yards a game. So they're not More than Alabama. They are, they are playing really well offensively. Now, I don't know the athletes or the amount of athletes that, that Vanderbilt has. If Brady Cook is injured, if he's healthy, you're good to go. If Luther Burden, I was going to say Luther Head, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an Illini yeah. to, to the day I die. <laughs> Luther Burden is, is healthy and able to go, you're good to go. But, you know, just making sure that you go in there and, as you said, don't assume that this is Vandy. We got to stay ready for next week. No, you got to take care of this test first and go in there and beat Vanderbilt. Otherwise, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be an embarrassing loss if they lose to Vanderbilt. And by the way, Brooke, in their last three games, Vandy has allowed 36 40 and 45 points. So 36, 40, mm-hmm. 44, more, five more. So this they should allow 51 tomorrow, yeah. according to the math. Oh, okay. Is that, yes. is that how math works? Is, is that how the math thing works? Yeah, they lost by that. four, they lost by five, and now they should lose by six. I think All the right. biggest things, too, is just watching how hopefully these injuries are not anything that are going to hamper Brady Cook or Luther Burden because Mizzou's <laughs> offense, I feel like, has just gotten off to a really good start. They're averaging around like 30 points per game, 430 yards per game, but and this is just a but, just something that I know that they can continue to improve upon is on third down, right? I mean, that's something that we have seen throughout these first four games. And if you even look at some of the numbers, they are 16 of 44 on third down this season. And the last two games, three of 21. And that's something that even Eli Drink was talked about last week after the Memphis game is that they need to improve on that. How do you think that they do improve on that moving forward? I thought they did a, I thought they did a really good job offensively having explosive yeah. plays. They were they were getting guys, mm-hmm. you know, open, finding guys downfield, making big plays, and I thought that was really good. And, and they ran the ball well. They ran yeah. it when they needed to. Cody Schrader had 123 yards. They Nathaniel Pete had a really good game as well. They ran. They took it to Memphis, and I was really pleased with that. Like I said, the explosive plays, the ability to run it when you needed to. Offensively, I really liked what they were doing. Defensively, they gave up some some plays, which you know. I don't think you should have given those up to Memphis. Memphis had some some big plays here and there. But all in all, I thought Mizzou played really well last weekend. And, you know, hopefully they can continue that. They have to go down there. It's not going to be anytime you're traveling to a to an, a, a division, a conference opponent on the road in their home. It's going to be a tough task no matter who it is. So hopefully they can keep all of those things rolling this weekend. And, Brooke, to answer your question, I think Mizzou needs to win on first down. You, you need to get that running game going. Vandy, Vandy is allowed 150 yards per game. You, got, you need to get yourself into second and four, second and three, third and one. That's how you start winning on third down. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think, too, CD, with your point, too, about explosive plays, that helps with things, too. And I think that there's a lot of questions going into this season. I know that everybody knows who Luther Burden is around here, but seeing if Luther Burden could take that next step, especially getting into the national spotlight mm-hmm. of things, and so far he's lived up to that because Mizzou without Dominic Lovett, that was the big question, yeah. is would they have a true deep threat? And I think you've gotten that answer. But here's the thing. We've talked about this. Things are going to get tougher and tougher once you get into that SEC part of the schedule because Luther Burden, everybody knows who he is yep. now. And exactly. then the biggest thing is, too, I thought that Speedy, they call him Speedy Johnson, mm-hmm. he had a big play. It was like yep. a 76-yard touchdown. And that was, he is. He lives up to his uh, nickname. Mm-hmm. I would like to see maybe him a little bit more, maybe establishing him more in this Vandy game so that you can prepare more for that SEC schedule. And I think Weiss can play. I think, n- number one, the transfer from Oklahoma can play, too. So they've got some other guys, and they're going to have to be able, like, like you said, Brooke, they're going to be able to, 
have to be able to move the ball without Luther Burden because even if he's there, good defenses like Georgia are going, Florida, are, they're going to take him away. They have athletes that are his equal, and yeah. they're going to be able to take Luther Burden well, away. Well, you're going to have to find ways to keep him involved in the game plan, whether it's putting him in a slot, moving him outside, motioning him, things that allow you, A, to know what coverage that you're facing if he's going in motion, and B, allows you to get him open because he's in mo- in movement. So finding creative ways to get him the ball. And then other guys got to step up and make plays. They had 18 receptions uh, on Saturday. Ten of them went to Luther. So yeah. that lets mm-hmm. you know that they are not distribu- distributing the ball enough to the other guys. They're focusing on Luther. And if the offense, if Mizzou is focusing on him, you can, bear, you can bet that the defense will be focusing on him as well. And last 100%. week, the defense, they gave up a touchdown when they fumbled at the 10-yard line, gave up another one when they uh, – I'm not one to say bad play call, but it was a bad play call when they tried to tr- throw the ball on fourth and one. They, they should have run the ball for the first down, but all of the momentum switched at that point to Memphis, and then they gave up a garbage touchdown. So the defense actually played well, and they're going to have to up their game a little bit again as they get into the SEC. Mizzou and Vandy tomorrow, 3 o'clock start, and you can see that game on SEC Network or just drive down to Vandy. I think tickets will be available. <laughs> <laughs> you can you basically so? sit wherever you want yeah. in that in that stadium. And maybe, I don't know, maybe they've even proved a little bit fan-wise. I will say tailgating is pretty fun over mm-hmm. at Vandy. I did see that, like, going to the season, they were working on some construction, and that wasn't finished, so there were some issues with that. I don't know if that's affected tailgating. But, yeah, you could go and have a fun weekend in Nashville. N- Nashville. And how proud of you, how, how proud of Carrie are you, Matthew, Brooke, Randy? We're all proud of you for wearing your black and gold today. Oh, this is oh, <laughs> M-I-Z. Yes. Nah, nah, this is Pittsburgh no. still with black and gold. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> would have gone three for three, man. I never would have gone three for it's three. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you want a fighter, Matthew? I only need a fighter. <laughs> All right. You can text into the uh, the Air Comfort Service text line, 314-399-9646, yo ho Text in your name and the word fight, and maybe you'll fight me next on 101 ESPN.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Cardinals yesterday fall to the Brewers 3 to nothing. They will start their last series of the season against the Cincinnati Reds tonight. 7-15 first pitch will be Brandon Williamson, the lefty for Cincinnati, facing off against Jake Woodford for the Cardinals. Last night in Preseason action, the Blues fall to the Blackhawks 2-1 to one in overtime. Connor Bedard getting two primary assists on both the Blackhawks' goals. And coming up this weekend, St. Louis City SC back in action. They face off against Kansas City, Sporting Kansas City, I should say, at City Park. And also coming up this weekend, it is Illinois and Purdue in a Big Ten matchup. That's 2.30 p.m. kickoff on Saturday. And then a 3 p.m. kickoff for number 23, Missouri, facing off against Vanderbilt. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga. Hitting and cooling. An independent American air heating air conditioning dealer. Welcome to the fight. In the red corner, average Joe listener. And in the blue corner, the undisputed king of morning drive. Please welcome Randy Carricker. Back to the opening drive. I am Kerry Davis, joined by Brooke Grimsley, and it is time for the fight. And our fighter today is Chris. Chris, how you doing? I'm doing great. How's your? Uh, what are your plans for the weekend? Uh, probably a little golf. Little golf. Watch a little football. Okay, sounds like a pretty good weekend. All right, here we go. Who is the only Major League Baseball franchise to never tally a hundred loss season? Is it the Colorado Rockies, the Texas Rangers, or the Los Angeles Angels? The Angels. Who was the first player to ever return a ball 109 yards for a touchdown, doing so on a missed field goal? Was it Jacoby Jones, Antonio Cromartie, or Devin Hester? Jacoby Jones. Happy birthday to Calvin Johnson. The number two overall pick in the 2007 NFL draft was taken above. Oh, sorry. The number two overall pick in the 2007 NFL draft was taken above him. Is it Matthew Stafford, Mario Williams, or Jamarcus Russell? Stafford. Final question. Who recorded the last out of the Cardinals' 1982 World Series victory? Was it Bruce Suter, Keith Hernandez, or Willie McGee? Bruce Suter. All right, we will double-check our score, and we will bring in Randy Carricker. (laughs) <laughs> How you feeling, Chris? I'm over here trying to reread this question that clearly baffled me that I didn't get a chance to read prior to, and it just was worded in a way that I was unable to process mentally. You said worded in a way. Freddie, say hello to Chris. Chris, good morning. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for listening. Thanks for playing. We do appreciate you tuning in. Just saw Adam Betts, our friend from Family Golf out in the hallway. Yes. I was talking to him. Mm-hmm. Everything's going well over at Family Golf. And if you want to practice your golf this weekend, can't hurt by going over there. Yes. It was a lot of fun. I was telling him I was out on the driving range recently with an old coworker over at Channel 4, and we had a blast. So, yeah. All right, Randy, you ready? Ready. All right, here we go. Who is, who is the only Major League Baseball franchise to never tally a 100 lost season? The obvious thought here would be the uh, New York Yankees. I think yesterday we established that the Mets are not that franchise. No. Um, yeah, they had a rough one. The Rockies and the Diamondbacks have both lost 100. The Rays have lost 100. Uh, I'm just going by the recent uh, recent expansion teams. I kind of think the Yankees, well, I don't know. I'll just, I'll, I'll play the chalk and go with the Yankees. Cardinals have back in the day, back in the early 1900s. Okay. Who was the first player to ever return a ball 109 yards for a touchdown doing so on a missed field goal? I th- think it was Ed Reed, but I'll do the lifeline. Tell me if uh, Ed Reed's on the lifeline. Go ahead. Give me the lifeline. Do you want me to give you the lifeline? Sure. Okay. Jacoby Jones, Antonio Cromartie, or Devin Hester? Jacoby Jones, Ravens, not Devin Hester. Who was the other one? Jacoby. Cromartie. Cromartie. Um, 
Maybe Antonio Cromartie? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Kobe Jones, Devin Hester. Yeah. Um, I, Jacoby Jones, thought it was a Raven. Um, I don't think it was Devin Hester. Jacoby Jones or Cromarty. Antonio Cromarty. Is he the one with 17 kids? I think it's, like I think it's 13, but yes. 13? Okay. <laughs> Madonna. He was asked to name him off one time and he got to like number 12. And he said, Madonna. <laughs> um, I don't think that was a real name. He also said the name, same name twice. Yeah. Well, it's hey, George, George Foreman. Foreman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will go with uh, Antonio Cromartie. Happy birthday to Calvin Johnson, the number two overall pick in the 2000 NFL draft. Who was taken above him at number one? 2002? 2007. 2007. NFL draft. Number two pick. Okay. He was the number so, two pick in the 2007 seven. NFL draft. Number two pick in the Who was taken above him? Okay, this was the infamous Ty Hill draft. So, 2005, you had Mario Williams. 2006, if I'm not mistaken. No, 2006 would have been Williams. Was 2007 Jamarcus Russell? 2008 was Jake Long. We're asking you, Randy. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself. Here. Oh, okay. Are you trying to trap us? Yeah. 2005 was Williams. Was it not? 2006, I think almost. Yeah, because we're talking 2007. 2006 would have been Williams, I think. 2007 would have been Jamarcus. 2008 was Jake. I just want to go back and make sure that I got this right. 2000, 2005 was Alex Smith. Okay. 2006, Mario Williams. 2007, Jamarcus Russell. There you go. Final answer? Final answer. All righty. Why, why, I asked Scott Linehan, do teams <laughs> like... <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Do teams like Jamarcus Russell so much? Because he can throw he the can ball throw 90 the yards. Ball. Yeah, he can stand there and throw it like you ever need to. On his knees, 90. If you ever yeah. need to throw the ball 90 yards, you're probably in a bad situation. Yeah. That yeah. your quarterback yeah. probably yeah. got you yep. into. Yeah. Uh, Kyle Bowler was from his oh. knees 50 yards through the goalposts. That's nice. <laughs> Another right. former Ram. Final. Great, great guy. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah, Jamarcus Russell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the purple drank. Oh, the purple drank. You know, it's tasty. Yeah. Get a little Jolly Rancher any, there. You get a little bit of, any of that purple drink. Tasty stuff, yeah. Hmm. Jamarcus. Okay. Who recorded the last out of the Cardinals 1982 World Series victory? Like, who was the hitter? I, that was driving me crazy, or who was the pitcher that threw the all the pitches? We just read the questions. We just read the questions. Read the questions who was the pitcher don't. and or fielder who recorded the last out? Hmm. Well, so it, it was a strikeout of Gorman Thomas by Bruce Souter. That's a winner. That's a winner, a World Series winner for the Cardinals. Uh, and, uh, yes, Gorman Thomas kept fouling off split fingers. And finally, Bruce Souter, this was back in the day. This was back in my day. Bruce Souter got him <laughs> with, with an 87-mile-an-hour four-seamer. That wouldn't happen today. No? Bruce Souter would not be able to. He, he would not uh, be Adam, drafted. Adam threw, uh, uh, he was throwing a four-seamer by 88. Yeah. His last start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he, he wouldn't get drafted oh, today no, throwing okay, that, yeah. though. Well, Bruce Souter was able to close it out. Was Randy Carricker able to close it out here on a Friday? Ring that bell. The winner and still champion of the fight, Randy Carricker. The fight is presented by Golf Discount of St. Louis with the most experienced club fitters in town. Why shop anywhere else? I'm sorry, Chris. You fell to Randy today, three to two. Good job. All right, thanks. It Good was job, a close Chris. one. The only MLB franchise to never tally a hundred loss season. By the way, this question changed three or four days ago when the Rockies actually lost their first mm. ever hundredth game. It is still only the Los Angeles Angels who have never lost a hundred mm -hmm. games. The Highlanders, the precursor Highlanders to the Yankees, did lose in did uh, not in the early 1900s. Did lose a hundred games. Well, the greatest movie of all time. Who was the last first? Who was the first <laughs> player to ever return a ball 109 yards for a touchdown? It was in fact Antonio Cromartie jumping up and grabbing it, landing just inside, and then taking. 
taking it back. Happy birthday to Calvin Johnson. He was the number overall, number two overall pick in the 2007 draft, and it was, in fact, Jamarcus Russell selected above him. And who recorded the last out of the Cardinals' 1982 World Series victory? It was, in fact, Bruce Suter with a strikeout of, was it Gorman? Gorman Thomas. Gorman Thomas. And so a 3-2 victory for Randy Carricker in the fight today. And I'm telling a guy, I'm, a, I'm an usher, uh, right on the first base side, right, right next to the Cardinal dugout. The guy comes down to the rail because the commissioner and uh, the owners had left and everything. I said, you're not coming down on the field. He said, yes, I am. I said, you're not coming down on the field. Yes, I am. Suter strikes out Thomas. He and 45,000 other people come down on the field. Oh, get to it. I got mine, though. I got mine, though. The guy that tried to steal Lonnie's cap. So it was good. There you go. Good job, Randy. I I hope he still feels it. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Coming up, uh, you may have read about the Blues practice facility having a payment missed by the city of Maryland Heights. We're going to talk about that with the Blues president, Chris Zimmerman, next on 101 ESPN.
are back in action tomorrow night against the Stars. We'll have it for you here at 5 o'clock with the pregame here on 101 ESPN, your home of the St. Louis Blues. You may have noticed during the week in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that the city of Maryland Heights missed a payment for the Centene Ice Center. And we would like to know what's going on with this situation because we want the Centene Ice Center to thrive and, and to do great. And so our friend, the president of the St. Louis Blues, Chris Zimmerman, joins us now on the opening drive on 101 ESPN. Zim, always good to talk to you. Good morning. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good, Randy. We're in, we're in go time now. So uh, excited about everything that's going on and uh, lots, lots of good things coming up in, in our hockey world. Looking forward to it. The, uh, the opener is just a couple of weeks away. Okay, number one, uh, in this regard, with the, the City of Maryland Heights missing a payment on the Centene Ice Center, are you concerned? Should we as fans be concerned? Um, no, there should be zero concern. Um, you know, this, uh, these facilities are, um, you know, they're not the easiest business model. And, and maybe importantly for me to say, I, I really wear two hats um, in this conversation. Obviously, my role representing the Blues I'm also a board member of the Legacy Ice Foundation, which was the entity that was created to help us grow hockey. And, um, you know, that group worked with the city of Maryland Heights to build what, as I've said it before, I, I say top three to five, um, you know, facilities of its type in the country. And I, and I only say that because I, I believe uh, we need to stay hungry and, and make sure that others believe that too. So the facility um, without question on many levels is already thriving and helping us build the game. And um, yes, there are some financial challenges. I don't minimize those um, in both roles that I play. Uh, we work with, we'll be working with the city and have been working with the city. So um, it's a, it's a very dramatic headline, but rest assured, this building is going to continue to thrive. So now moving forward, what are you guys doing in place to make sure that things kind of get righted? I know that you mentioned there that the headline that you feel maybe was a little bit dramatic, but reading through the story, I think that some people got concerned with seeing that. But what would you like for people to understand about this and how you guys are approaching this moving forward? Yeah, you know, thanks, Brooke. Um, you know, I think there are a few things. Um, the, I mean, obviously any, any, so... First of all, the, the entity itself on an operating level before debt is, is meaningfully profitable. We're not, we're short on our mortgage. And, and two key things, maybe there's, there's more, but certainly, you know, it opened, the building opened six months before the pandemic started. And obviously was like many public facilities was hit hard. Then you come out of that. And we do have the most inflationary time on basic supplies and labor that we've seen, that anyone has seen in some time. So um, we need to find the right adjustments with our key tenants. Um, we need to, you know, continue to build other programs. But the ice time, our ice time is essentially sold out. Um, we're attracting you know, world-class events um, and, you know, making a big difference already in, you know, sort of the community and, and certainly the, the economy. But, yes, um, there's a biz there are business issues of, you know, maximizing the opportunity around this facility that we'll be, we'll be addressing. Chris, you said that everything is, is going to be fine and everything is in good shape. But when you see a number like $18 left in the account, that gives uh, people some some drastic, I guess, feelings when they see that. What was that number and, and how did it get to that number? Yeah, um, well, when you have a shortfall, I mean, we, we have there are capital accounts. There are multiple accounts that um, uh, but it's um, that lead to that number and the city 
is covering um, the shortfall, has been covering the shortfall of bonds. They've been a great partner. They'll continue to be a great partner. But I can assure you, I mean, we put, we and other private entities <clears throat> that are, have, it really as donors, um, funded about 25% of this project. So the private community, the St. Louis Blues, are heavily invested in, in the facility and will continue to be. So I, I can sit here with great clarity knowing that, we're gonna, that we are already working on paths to addressing that. So, uh, yeah, that's $18. Um, you say that about anything, and, so, and people are going to be alarmed. But, um, again, whether it's um, the ACHA uh, college championships helping Lindenwood make a move to Division I, um, growing the game locally. And I, I think that this is an important point that part of the work that we do in the facility is growing participation throughout the region. So since the Cup, We've grown the number of registered hockey players by almost 30%. Then that's a big, big number. It's, it comes from our girls' programs. It comes from our North City Blues. Our Little Blues program feeds players to the entire region. So I just it's really important that people understand that the many levels and I think the critical levels that this facility is delivering on the promises we made to have it be a hub for hockey in the Midwest. Two more things for Chris Zimmerman, and you mentioned a hub for hockey in the Midwest because, Chris, I live in the Westport area, and so on the weekends I see the cars that are filling the parking lots and the, the young hockey players coming out, going to the rink. I see the restaurants full of young hockey teams, and it really is a driving engine economically for the region, not just because people are playing hockey there, but because people are coming into Maryland Heights and staying in Maryland Heights and spending money in Maryland Heights to have youngsters play hockey over there yeah i mean thank you yeah without question um i don't have um you know we often try to have clarity around the economic impact the number of room nights i I don't have those numbers but but we set out to bring a million people through the facility a year there's also what has become a thriving summer concert business um uh, at the St. Louis Music Park, which is what the what it becomes when we take up the outdoor rink, and so yes, without question, we're delivering uh, visitors. Um, you all know we spoke a few weeks ago, I believe, about the World Junior um, Championships that we are one of the finalists for, and that this facility um, and really our region would be key to driving that success. Um, That process is probably in its last 30 days. Um, You can imagine I picked up the phone and had a conversation somewhat similar to this with USA Hockey um, when the story came out. And um, so um, we are still a key, um, you know, candidate to to win that. And I, 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 as I tell them and as I tell um, people about our community and how we step up, I just have complete confidence that we can bring that event here and make it, make it just shine. Final thing for Chris Zimmerman, president of the St. Louis Blues. The main thing is the main thing, and your hockey team is showing signs of being really exciting this year. A lot of interesting parts of it, including the size that Craig Berube likes. And I know there's still tickets available for people that want to see Blues hockey in 23-24. Still tickets available and uh, for what should be a pretty exciting club. Yeah, well, I think I think there's, you know, I think people... I think we have a lot of storylines uh, of, of, and great storylines of players who, who have come, players who, that we have acquired in interesting ways. Um, yeah, I think that um, 
there's a lot to be excited about blues hockey. And yep, we, we open opening night, October oh, home opener um, is on Saturday, October 14th. We'll open um, the season in Dallas two nights earlier. So um, we have our work cut out for us, but um, it's going to be some fun hockey for sure. Chris Zimmerman, we always like having you on the show. Thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it. We appreciate the explanation. We know a whole lot more than we did 10 minutes ago. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you later. That's Chris Zimmerman, the president of your St. Louis Blues, here on 101 ESPN. And again, the Blues and Stars tomorrow night, pregame at 5, here on 101 ESPN. We've got our Rush Hour reset for you next on the opening drive. Hey, tomorrow is going to be crowded in downtown St. Louis. You've got City SC playing. You've got the Cardinals playing. You know what? The best way to get downtown is tomorrow. Avoid the expense. Avoid the hassle of traffic and parking. And just hop on Metrolink, whether you live in Richmond Heights or Fairview Heights or Maryland Heights. Ride on. As a matter of fact, if you just park at the Clayton Station, this is what I do. Park at the Clayton Station. Take Metrolink down to City Park or to the ballpark. And it'll make such a big difference for you. It is so much less stressful than driving. And you don't have the wear and tear on your vehicle. It really does make a difference. If you want to have a healthy, vibrant St. Louis, then a healthy and vibrant public transportation system is critical. It's not only there to help you individually, but you can attract businesses. The city can attract businesses. They create a significant amount significant amount of jobs to the region. If you use Metro, it changes things dramatically. If you need flexibility, the Metro offers various ticket options and schedules to accommodate your busy lifestyle. Don't let preconceived notions hold you back. Give Metro a chance and experience the benefits for yourself. In short, thanks to Metro, you don't have to drive to thrive.
recapping the biggest sports stories of the day on the opening drive with a rush hour reset. Uh, Brooke Grimsley, who is very helpful for those of us that don't always pay attention, uh, reminded us over the course of this last break. She said, don't forget to get your Powerball tickets, which uh, <laughs> we, we will do. We'll we'll take care of that. I did mine yesterday. I, I went and got mine. Now, I have a question for you guys. $25 million is the jackpot tomorrow. Oh, is it? Yeah. And so my I'll question you for later. you guys <laughs> is, <laughs> do you guys, when you're going out and buy, buying lottery tickets, what is your thought process? Because I always kind of pick gas stations that are not the big gas stations i kind of pick smaller ones because in my mind for some reason i think that that's going to help me but does anybody else have like a certain approach when it comes to lottery tickets i only buy at the mobile on the run up here at chilty and olive okay i uh put my own numbers in like i don't let them pick no, the numbers no quick picks is no. it just like gut like this yeah, is the number that's coming it, it, up first i let it talk to me kind of like you know <laughs> no, when i'm at the this. roulette table i, I figure out like, oh yeah 24 right Whatever's there. Talking just, to, yeah you, you you have to feel it in your gut and and then you go with that number yeah yeah, that's how it goes. Why are you looking at me like that, Rob? I'm going to take all those approaches and go buy some more lottery the tickets. The lottery has indeterminate odds. A craft okay. table has set odds that you can know. Says you. No, it says the table okay. says it. Like, the odds are written on the table. Hey, guess what? Okay. You go with your gut in that's certain situations, mm-hmm. and that's how you win games. This is a lesson for so all those that are So you say your marker at eight, you're betting on fours? If I want to bet on Stop. what I want to bet on... That's what I do. Stop. Why does Tony Lewis have the second most wins in baseball because history? Because he went with his gut. <laughs> Trust his gut. That's why. There you go. Yep. Uh, at the Ryder Cup, Just the saying. United States in danger of going down 8 nil. They were already down 4 nil after the early action this morning. Right now, Hatton and Hovland lead Thomas and Spieth 1 up through 12. Rahm and Hogard leading Kepka and Scheffler. Actually, they're all square through 11. Rose and McIntyre leading Ahoma and Wyndham Clark one up through 10. And McElroy and Fitzpatrick leading Shoffley and Morikawa six up through nine holes. They halved the first hole, and then McElroy and Fitzpatrick won holes numbers two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and then they've halved <laughs> eight and nine. So Rory having a day. Guys, I don't even know if you put Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth first, if that would have helped Team USA, because, yeah. I mean, Europe is just literally throwing everything at them, and I, I don't know. I, I see why Jay's very upset this morning when we talk to him. because his dog it, is happy. Yeah, his dog is but happy. he's not. No. Yeah. No, I can I can understand why now. I don't know if there was any other strategy that could have helped USA in this one. I don't think so. Cardinals lost yesterday. Shocker, three nothing <laughs> to how the many, Baltimore. How many games have they lost now? Uh, ninety. Ninety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Forty-five and forty-five on the road in the home. But fortunately, this weekend we're going to close things out by honoring Adam Wainwright tonight. Scott Williamson. Is it Scott Williamson still? Little pitch for the Reds. Uh, Brandon Williamson. I'm sorry. They used to have a guy named Scott Williamson. Uh, Brandon Williamson will go for the uh, Red Legs as they take on the Cardinals. And Jake Woodford is 2-2 two two with a 5.09. Oh, Jake. Jake, the winning pitcher, I believe, in uh, in Game 6 in 2011 uh, when David, David Freeze hit the home run. Jake Woodford? Oh, maybe not. Maybe it was Jake Westbrook. I believe Whatever. that's the birthday boy, Jake Westbrook. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to Jake Westbrook, by the way. How old is J-Dub? Uh, that's a very good question. I, no, I don't worry about it. Off the top of my head. Don't, I'm <laughs> don't worry about it. He'll I just remember saying Happy that Happy birthday earlier. to him. Happy birthday he's doing well. <laughs> nice. uh, City plays tomorrow against Sporting KC, that big rivalry match. Match on the pitch in the kits at City Park. In their boots. Yep, looking forward to that. And we are closing in on having home pitch throughout the playoffs. Yeah, you get a win win, win uh, on Saturday. You're one point away. All you yes. need is a, a draw in your last uh, couple games. So do they call it home field or home pitch? Home and, pitch. And, and, Son and of a, we oh heard God, I've been writing home field it, all over the place. We heard Carnell like, call it a tie. Of a pitch. So we draw. can. He called it a tie. <laughs> yeah. Didn't he? he called FCC, it a tie. I didn't so say we it can. Wrong we there are some some. Ooh. There's a little room for, yeah, well, for error didn't here. Didn't Carnell also say game? See what he I'm saying? Did. So, so it's fine. We are okay to not. I want to be official though because I get a lot of reacts on the on the text machine okay. when I'm not official. Well, yeah, Randy, the problem is you're dealing with a league that is again called Major League Soccer, uh-huh. where there's like 15 teams that are called an FC. Uh huh. <laughs> what do they know? It's clearly confusion. Which one is it? Is it Minnesota that's called FU? <laughs> no, that M U F C. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. M-U-F-C. Football United. Football United. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Good team. Yeah. Good That's program. what we should have been. 
<laughs> St. Louis Football United. No, oh, no, 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 Randy. Yeah, STL. Yeah, F U. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, CD. I appreciate it. I, I, made, some, I made something because earlier in the segment we were talking about the card, or early in the show we were talking about the Cardinals, so I had to pull this from my favorite from Major League. Who are these guys? Yeah. That could have been the SCLFU. That could have been how we walked into the stadium. Who are these effing guys? Yeah. It's a missed opportunity, is what that seems like. <laughs> we got a lot coming up for you. Diamondbacks and Astros tonight here on 101 ESPN pregame at 8. Tomorrow, you've got Arkansas and Texas A&M. They play at 11 o'clock, 1030 pregame. How'd you like to be get Arkansas getting that 11 o'clock in the morning game? Mm. Uh, <laughs> hockey tomorrow night, Blues and Stars pregame at 5. A triple header for NFL on Sunday, Browns and Ravens at 11. Chargers and Raiders at 3. Jets and Chiefs at 720. And then the Blues and Blue Jackets, October 2nd. That's Monday night with the pregame at 5 here on your home of the Blues, 101 ESPN. By the way, Mizzou and Vandy tomorrow at 3 o'clock SEC Network at Vanderbilt. And Lindenwood tomorrow at 1 o'clock at Harlan C. Hunter Stadium over in St. Charles on the campus of Lindenwood University. The Lions will take on the Governors of Austin P. Whose fans say, "Let's go pee." There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's not. That's not a pee. I like how I like how Coach said that earlier, where he was just like, "Yeah." When I heard that, that's I was like, strange. "I don't know if I you could." Know, that job. <laughs> they even send you flyers that say that. It's yeah. it's amazing. There's your rush hour reset. It's nine thirteen. Time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler, and our buddy Chip Carey joins us next on one hundred one ESPN. Sumner one. With Brooke Grimsley and Carrie Davis, I'm Randy Carricker, and as we do every Friday, we go to the celebrity line, and our friend, the TV voice of the Cardinals, Chip Carey, joins us. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? 
I'm doing great, guys. Great to be home for the final weekend. I was going to ask you, that was going to be my first question, because uh, uh, we don't travel six months of the year, and uh, the the grueling, the schedule for baseball can be grueling. How do you handle it, and do you have to decompress after a season is over because you have done so much traveling over the course of the previous six months? Oh, absolutely. I have friends around the business who ask me every year, what's the first thing you're going to do when you get home? And I said, probably get yelled at. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, we, we were, we're on the road. We're living out of a suitcase and, and staying in beautiful, wonderful places and great towns and hotels on someone else's dime. That part of it's fun. But, yeah, the, the grind of travel and not being in your own bed and, you know, reconnecting with friends and family, that's always a, a wonderful challenge. But I'm used to it by now. I've been doing this for over 30 years. So <laughs> I think I've got that part figured out. Hopefully I will, and I'll find out for sure on Monday. So basically your wife has six months to come up with a honey-to-do list, or should I say honey-to-do book, essentially, for you when oh, you're yeah, done? She's, yeah, yeah, Brooke, she has that, and usually every year on January 15th, it's like, hey, when does the season start again? I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to get my sanity back. So, uh, yeah, there'll, there'll be a big honey-to-do list, but that's the kind of stuff I like to do. Well, things wrapping up this weekend for the Cardinals, which is very weird to say. I know that it's hard to talk about maybe some positives right now with the Cardinals, but one positive, or I guess it will be kind of a sad positive, bittersweet, is saying goodbye to Adam Wainwright. What are you expecting this weekend in this final goodbye to Wayno? I hopefully it's filled with joy and happiness and, and fun. There'll be some tears, I'm sure. Hopefully a lot of uh, joyful tears. Uh, this guy was a, a former Atlanta Brave number one pick. He was from the South, didn't know much about uh, toasted ravioli and Ted Drews, and came here and became a civic icon with uh, you know one of the most uh, decorated franchises in the history of all of sports. A uh, great uh, civic ambassador, a great ambassador for the team, wonderful father and husband, and obviously a terrific pitcher for the Cardinals. And those are the things that I hope everybody will remember and focus on. We're going to, I'm sure, uh, on our weekend's worth of coverage. And you know, it's hard to encapsulate an 18-year career in three days or perhaps one plate appearance. But, uh, I think uh, Adam's at peace with it. I know we're all excited for him as he starts his next chapter in life, and we'll all leave very, very grateful for the contributions he made, just for, not for the Cardinals, but for Major League Baseball as a whole. Chip, we've seen a lot of guys called up this season. Uh, are you surprised that with all the injuries to the outfield, to the pitching staff, that you didn't see some of the younger guys like Graceffo, McGreevy, maybe a Moises Gomez? Uh, you know, I don't know the whole the whole deal on that, uh, Gary. I think a lot of that has to do with 40-man roster spots, and there's more to it than just their performances down there. Uh, you know, starting arbitration clocks and all of that plays into it as well. Uh, but those guys, I'm sure, are going to get a very long look in spring training. Uh, they're, they're important parts of the organization, and they may be here in St. Louis, or may, they may be guys that are moved when the Cardinals go uh, shopping this offseason for more pitching talent or positional player talent. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's good to have options. Uh, the options the Cardinals Cardinals made are the ones that Mo made. He only he knows the reasons for that, but I would assume that roster construction is probably the biggest part of it. Hey Chip, uh, we've been admiring the Astro or the uh, the Braves, and y you worked with the Braves for a long time, and it's really interesting how many guys they just trot out there to play their position every single day. Can you just tell us a little bit because you know um, Brian Snitker very well? Philosophically, how do they approach? trotting out a lineup every day as opposed to some other franchises they have guys that like to play and want to play every day and feel like they're letting their team and their manager and fans down if they don't they sign up for 162 that was a philosophy that bobby cox had and that was not just for positional players but relief pitchers too he was not afraid to use a guy three days in a row if it was going to help the team win and he knew how to manage that workload uh, i think that's going to be fascinating to watch from a cardinals perspective how that changes here i think we had a lot of I don't want to say redundant pieces, but a lot of similar pieces that can play similar positions. And as, as a result, guys were moving around an awful lot, both in the lineup position and uh, positionally defensively uh, for the team uh, this year. And I think everybody would prefer to have six or seven guys go out there, play one spot and play 140 times. And the ineffectiveness and injury didn't allow that this year. And I know that's something that everybody's looking forward to seeing change next year. Outside of the Braves, is there another team that you're interested to watch and see during this postseason? I want to see all the new teams get in, right? I mean, the Texas Rangers. I want to see the Baltimore Orioles and what they can do. Uh, I think the Phillies have a great chance of, uh, of – 
pulling a surprise and getting to the World Series again? How will the young rookie Dodgers starters pitch? I mean, their whole bolt, their whole uh, rotation has been decimated by injury. All those kids and Clayton Kershaw, uh, and then in the American League, you know, uh, is Seattle going to make it? Are the defending champs going to make it? I mean, it's going to be a wide, uh, a wide open battle here this final weekend. And of course, uh, Cardinal fans probably, probably pulling for Skip Schumacher and the Marlins to get in as well. And if they can avoid the grounds crew in New York, I think they have a pretty good shot. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Jim, we How were bad t- is that? Oh, oh man, it was, God, it was poor, terrible. I, I, my take it or leave it this morning was, hey, baseball and the Mets are out to get the Marlins because it wasn't just last night. It was the weekend, too, right, where they just let the yeah. infield get soaked. Yeah, I, I guess they don't have the National Weather Service up there or something. All those expensive players, they couldn't afford Internet or something. I don't know, but that was that was a really bad look. And it's unfortunate now because that game, that outcome with, with the Marlins leading, that's going to mean something. I don't see anybody pulling away by two or three games here over the final three days of the regular season, which means Miami may have to go back to New York and play one inning, one inning, with a one-run lead for a game that could be critically important for them and then go to their next playoff spot. that That's just awful, the way that that turned out, not just that day, but uh, the earlier game uh, on that series with New York. Chip, this is a guy you got to see often, uh, pretty much every day in the last couple of years. When I say the name Ronald Acuna Jr., what's the first thing that comes to mind? Electric. Uh, you know, when he came up as a rookie and debuted against the Reds in Cincinnati and hit a home run in his second or third game, uh, we said, okay, the, you know, he's he, you know, he's – He's a, he's a pretty good player, and he's turned from a pretty good player to a superstar to a guy coming back from injury, and he's been able to elevate his game. Uh, I can't think of a player who has benefited more from the rules changes. Uh, the reckless abandon with which he plays is his personality and his style. He's just a big, giant kid. And I think uh, having been gotten married now, he has two children. I think there's been a lot more perspective for Ronald watching from uh, you know up close and now from afar. There's a maturity to his life and a maturity to his game. It's all about the winning. It's not about all the stuff. And I think that's going to make him a very, very exciting and dangerous player, not just for the Braves this year in the postseason, but probably for the next decade uh, because his era has begun. And he's, a, he's a joy to watch unless you have to play him. And we've got 150 years of baseball, and he's the first 40-70 guy. I would guess that we'll probably go another 150 years, and he'll still be the only 40-70 guy. Unless he does it again, which is quite possible <laughs> yeah, right. in 2024. <laughs> So, uh, Chip, we really have appreciated you joining us every week during the season this year. It's been a lot of fun. We'll do it again next year. We do want to call you, though. Uh, we'll call you uh, right before the Saturday, November 4th. We'll, we'll have you on November 3rd before Mizzou plays Georgia. That sounds like a plan. I look forward to it. I, I, I think we'll be out of town, but you call, I'll answer. Uh, that's the way it will go, and I hate to say it to my St. Louis fans, but as a Georgia Bulldog, I've got to say it. Go dogs. That's how that's going to work out. I know you do. I'm going to be over there on Sunday. I'll stop by the booth and say hi and uh, I I just want to thank you again, but we really do appreciate it. We've enjoyed it. We hope you have too. Me, I have as well, and thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's been a great year, and uh, looking forward to even more fun in 24, guys. Have a great offseason. We'll see you soon. You too, Chip. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Chip Carey, the TV voice of the Cardinals on Bally Sports. And, yeah, it's it's amazing. Uh, and just talking to people over the years, and it really, the travel affected Jack Buck, and he never stopped because he would go into doing Sunday football and then Monday night football. So he was doing, for September, baseball and then Sunday football, Monday night football, and it, the travel never ended for him mm. until the Super Bowl. And then he'd have February off and then right back at it in March for spring training. But man, the the travel and like he like Chip said, they stay in the nicest hotels or they're traveling on charters, but that doesn't make it any easier physically yeah. for anybody. Oh you still have to deal with it. Yeah. And yeah. it is it can be a, a, phys- a grueling physical thing to have to travel that much. Yeah. How do you not get sick either yeah, right. is the biggest thing. I feel like sometimes when I just even step on a plane, I'm like instantly getting a cold or yeah. something like that. I, I think just he, he's done a fantastic job. I, I wish the Cardinals would have performed better this mm-hmm. year. It's been tough to watch. It's amazing that we are here three games left in the season. And it feels like we were just at the ballpark for opening day, uh, watching the Clydesdales and all of that, the fanfare that goes along with it. We thought that this would be a much better season. Unfortunately, it hasn't turned out that way. But, um, you know, this offseason, man, I keep saying is going to be so important for this franchise to see what they do. How do they spend their money? Are they willing to spend their money? Where are they going to go for pitching? Are they going to move some people around? What will the lineup look like from day to day? Hopefully we don't have the inconsistency where guys are, I don't know what I'm playing. Am I playing shortstop or first base? Am I playing catcher or or left field or DH? Just 
being consistent in your lineup and knowing where you are every day gives those guys more confidence to go out there and do their job effectively. That's Kerry Davis. That's Brooke Grimsley. I'm Randy Carricker. Coming up, it's Friday, and that means we're going to visit with Joey Vitale, one of our favorites of the week next on 101 ESPN.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals last night with a 3 0 loss to the Brewers. That closes out their road schedule for the year. They finish out the season with a three game series against Cincinnati Reds. Starts tonight, Dakota Hudson on the bump for the Cardinals. Also coming up this weekend, St. Louis City SC faces off against Sporting Kansas City at City Park. That's a 7 30. First kick for the game on Saturday. Also coming up in football over the weekend, Missouri number 23 faces off against Vanderbilt and Illinois with a Big Ten battle against Purdue. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Joey Vitale views things a little differently. Just imagine how he looks at hockey. This is The View from Vitale, brought to you by Scott Lee Heating Company, a proud Mitsubishi Electric Elite contractor. Joe Vitale does join us now here on the opening drive on 101 ESPN. We love Joey. He's a new CBC Hall of Famer. Good morning, sir. How you doing? Hey, Randy. Oh, please, 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 please stop that. Stop that right now. Uh, hey, thank you, guys. Good morning. How you doing? Everything's good. I want to know what you've been thinking about. Oh, whew, man. Um, oh, how about this? So it's National Coffee Day. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. Um, what, there, my, my kids know that my famous line is, you know, I'm one cup of coffee away from turning my day around. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and they, they just know it's coming. They know if there's only a few things I love in this world, pasta, bread, and coffee, and red wine. Those are the top four. Uh, and I will not I will not include my family in those top four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Ah. <laughs> so they know this. So it's National Coffee Day. I, I made my stop at my uh, my wonderful establishment here. Actually, uh, the Taleo is a coffee house here in Kirkwood. If you haven't been there, you live in a Kirkwood kind of-ish area, visit it. Taleo, uh, Olivia does a, a terrific job. She's been open for a couple of years. It's one of my favorite coffee spots. So I go in there. It's National Coffee Day. And I've been listening to my wife lately. And she's been telling me, Randy and, and gang, that I shouldn't be drinking iced coffee anymore. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, well, because you're a warmer person if you drink hot drinks. And this, according to the Asian culture, apparently, it helps soothe uh, <sighs> digestion and it helps with the blood flow of your body. And they say if you're ever, like, going out on a date, you should always have a warm cup of coffee versus a cold drink. And I looked into this more, and Yale actually did a study about this in 2008 where they say – you, they, they did studies where you become a warmer person after you drink a warm cup of coffee and you become a colder person from a personality standpoint when you drink an iced coffee. So, I don't know. I'm out here baking. It's October almost, and it's like 90 degrees. I'm in a hoodie, and I'm drinking a hot coffee. I'm just sweating like a mule. Joey, never drink iced coffee. I always drink hot. It, it, it's not even coffee. It's like chocolate milk. Or, or Yeah, it's chocolate milk once it's iced. There's it, no point in it. <laughs> So I, I agree with your wife. She is a very intelligent woman. You married her for a good reason. So listen to your wife. I'm going to go that direction. <laughs> it typically never fails me, Terry, when I do that. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, you know, and, much, and I, I love a cold brew. I, listen, I love a good iced cold brew. Uh, but on National Coffee Day, I had to listen to my wife. And I'm walking down the street to Kirkwood just sweating, drinking. <laughs> it's, it's a little warm now. you got to get accustomed to that. But it's okay. You, you'll cool off eventually. You're already a warm person. Now you'll be even more warm, Joey. I mean, I, you know what? Brooke, it's a great point. I said, babe, I mean, listen, how much awesomer can I be? <laughs> I wake up every day. I'm like, there's no possible way I can be any better. But apparently a warm cup of coffee might just do it. Well, of course, I guess we'll get into some hockey stuff now. Even though I, I love the coffee talk, I like both. So I... I understand both of them with that. But I uh, wanted to ask you about the Connor Bedard situation last night. Obviously, it was a big story seeing him. It seems like he's going to be a problem for many, many years to come. But that could also be a good thing when renewing the rivalry between the Blackhawks and Blues, right? I think so. You know, when, when Chicago won the lottery, you know, I think the majority of the people I heard from St. Louis were really upset, whether it be it rigged or now the competition's got one of the best players in the world. I, for one, was very excited. Because you look at it like now we're going to see this superstar for the next decade, decade and a half, hopefully, if he's end up being with Chicago. We're going to see him in these rivalry games. We're going to see him kind of grow into the league, which I think is awesome. You know, especially a player that is in the Western Conference. You look at players like Connor McDavid and now Connor Bedard. I mean, we're going to see these, these kids quite a bit. And you compare that to an Ovechkin or a Sidney Crosby, who the Blues only see twice a year. Uh, and for the Blues fans in St. Louis, only once a year. 
So I love the fact that he's going to be around. Um, what did I think about him last night? What have I heard about him? When you compare him with, say, a Sidney Crosby, a generational player, you know, I don't think he's quite as hyped up for right, rightful reasons as a Sidney Crosby, and certainly not a Connor McDavid. I don't think he's on their platform. Uh, could he get there? Possibly. Uh, but I think he's entering the league not quite at the stature of what Sidney Crosby and Connor McDavid were, and I think that, uh, that that is justifiable. You watch him last night, you know, Brooke, and a couple things obviously stand out right away. Um, he's a dancer. You give him a little bit of space. Um, he's going to walk you. He's going to make you look foolish. So this year, certainly for the Blues, it's going to be how do you – tightening that space up and not allow him to have so much ice. And that's where that three on three, he really just shined because there's so much ice for him to be creative. Uh, certainly that's number one. And number two, he's got a great shot. It's lethal. He only got it off about one or two times last night, but the way he drags it, the way he releases it, he changes the direction. He's got about 14 different types of shots in his toolbox. And he knows when to use them all. So again, for the blues, how do you tighten in the space? How do you become in his shadow, stick in his shadow, stay in his shadow? Uh, and certainly the hands full are going to be for Colton Pareko. But, you know, at the end of the day, I talked to Darren Pang about this before the game, who is now doing the broadcast for the Chicago Blackhawks. He's been around kind of a lot more. He said he's a kid, and he is a kid. Like, you look at him out there, he's he looks immature at times. He looks like a kid. He looks like he's got a lot of growing up to do because, heck, he's not even 20 years old yet. You know, so th- there is a lot of growing up to do for the young man. And I think Chicago's done a pretty decent job of trying to instill some veterans around him with a Taylor Hall, Nick Foligno, uh, Corey Perry, to try to get him up to speed as quickly as possible. Joey, much made of the size of the Blues as we get ready for the 23-24 season. What do you make of, of the bigger club than it was last year? And I guess the key is, what do you think of their ability to play? It's one thing to be big, but I'm big and I can't play. So uh, what do you think of their ability? Well, I tell you what, Randy, you know, the Blues went a different direction this year based off of how they did last year. You know, last year it was a speed team. It was an attack off the rush team. Uh, be off the rush and score off the rush. So they, they became a rush team last year. You know, I think that you looked at how the year unfolded. I think when push comes to shove and when the big boys got to stand up and fight, I think the Blues didn't, didn't hold up to their end of the bargain being a rush-style team. Look at last night. Yeah, the Blackhawks win that game in overtime. They have speed. They can they can kill you off the rush. A lot of young talent, and you get all that. But at some point, as the season progresses, I've always believed that big boy hockey will always win. Big boy hockey meaning having big, heavier guys that can dump it in, hold on to the puck in the offensive zone, really puck possess, kill time, draw penalties because the other team's exhausted in their own zone, attack and, and kill them on the power play because of the penalties drawn. You know, strike and kill the other team's will by making them play in the defensive zone. Maybe you're not generating a lot of chances. Maybe the game's still 0 0 at the end of two. But that was the style of Blues hockey in 2019 that won them a cup. They were just, they were constricting. They were like a bowl constrictor. They literally just would hang on, hang on, and they would just wear these teams out by playing that big, heavy style. I think Craig Bruby has always loved that style. I think he's always wanted to play that style. I think he didn't have the soldiers probably the last year, year and a half to play that style. So, I think Doug Armstrong's done a great job for him saying, okay, you want to play this style? You want to play big boy hockey? Let's get back to it. I agree. Here are the soldiers to do it. So you bring in Sammy Blake, right? You got Torpchenko. He's just another growing into another year. You bring in Oscar Sundquist. Kevin Hayes will be a great third line center. Big fellas down there that can get to the offensive zone and hold on to the puck. You look at every Stanley Cup champion, they play big boy heavy hockey. Uh, case in point, the Las Vegas Golden Knights last year. A few games into this preseason, has there any been anything that has impressed you most with what you've seen from this Blues team? You know, I think there are a couple things. You know, uh, right, right off the top of my head, you know, Joel Hofer, I think this is going to be a, a spectacular addition for the Blues all season long. I look at the way he moves. I look at the way he carries himself off the ice. Very mature for a young kid. I had a goaltender scout the other day tell me it perfectly, and and this is for all the Blues fans to fully understand. He said, you know, the thing about Joel, he's flexible, he's mobile, he's competitive, he moves just like Jordan Bennington, but he's a little bit bigger. So that's kind of scary when you think about that comparison because we all know what Bennington is. Obviously, the starter heading into the season, I think he could win you a big game. I think him next to Vasilevsky, I would take I would take one of those two guys in a big game. You had a must-win game seven. So for a young Joel Hofer to be that, that recognized as being that talented but just being even bigger than Jordan Bennington, I think could really help the Blues this year with the one-two tandem. 
Uh, the other thing off the top of my head I just noticed is that a lot of young players have really stepped up to the plate, have answered the bell, and have raised some eyebrows here. You know, in the last few preseasons that I remember, a lot of these games, Kerry, were very vanilla. Just kind of show up, play the game, get a bump, maybe get an assist, hop back on the plane, get your steak, let's go home, let's reset for tomorrow. There, there's been some attention to detail. There's been a huge care factor in this entire group, veterans and young guys alike. I'm looking at a player like Hunter Skinner last night, blowing up guys, picking fights, drawing Corey Perry into the fight, getting an extra – I mean, uh, Nick Ritchie's fought. We saw a Walker fight. Sammy Blaze fought. How about Samuel Bitten in his debut, fighting a big fellow there with Arizona? I mean, so a lot of young players taking full advantage of the little opportunity they're getting right now. Who gets in a fight first, Robert Thomas or Jordan Cairo this season? Or will you they know ever? What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we ever see that. Brooke, it's a great question. I could almost see Robert Thomas getting in the fight because it's Jordan Cairo that maybe, let's say, got blown up. Jordan Cairo, I will say, he, he's so fast, he's so creative, and I think at times he does put himself in some vulnerable spots. So the way I see it happening at some point in, in, their, in their career as this duo together I think Jordan Kyrie will probably cut to the middle, make himself vulnerable. He will get popped, and I think the closest Blues player will be Robert Thomas. And, you know, I really hope to see that one day. I think that's really great. We saw Tarasenko fight a couple times when he was in St. Louis. Obviously, when your superstar is fighting, uh, it really does kind of pump up the entire team. Joey V, is a late summer, fall your favorite time of year? No, unfortunately, Randy, this is probably the opposite. Hmm. You know, uh, the, yeah, the kids go back to school. Uh, I, I love my summers. Uh, I love my time with them. I'm always a spring guy because baseball starting, you're entering the NHL playoffs. The days are getting longer. One of the worst days of the year for me, Randy, is that when the clocks move forward. Oh, yeah. and, it's, <laughs> um, and it, it's like it goes from like overnight. It's like it starts getting dark at like 4:30 in the afternoon. You're like, why is it already getting dark? So, and then it starts getting colder. Listen, I like the green. I like spring. Like I mentioned, playoffs or hockey, baseball starting. There's a lot of great things to look forward to. So I would say uh, this is probably my opposite, Randy. Okay. The reason that I ask that is because you and I have, we're both Leos. You're August, an August 20th birthday. I'm August 19th. But in consecutive months, National Red Wine Day, August 28th. National Coffee Day, September 29th. National Pasta Day, October 17th. National Bread Day, November 17th. Ooh. Wow. You know what? Maybe I should be rethinking what season. I love that. I August, September, that. October, November, baby. Uh, Red wine, coffee, bread, and pasta every month? Yeah, the four in a row. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm going to start celebrating these days. Well, it's always, you know, it's, you know, Randy, it's always a bread day in my house. It's always a bread day. So that, that, that's always the national bread day here. Uh, but I did, I, know, I did go to Napa for the first time, actually, in August. Of all, and I think I was out there in late August when apparently it was National Wine Day. And I tell you what, it was, it was a great time. I loved going out with some friends and Never been to Napa before, but, man, we drank some wine. Woo. You know, this sounds weird because who who remembers a great omelet, right? But the best omelet I ever had was in Napa, California. I don't I don't know why. I don't know what made it great, but it was sensational. <laughs> I remember it vividly. There's something about I think about I think about this pasta dish I had in Rome. I think about it probably once at least a day uh, <laughs> when I'm just going through my, my world. You know, I'll be at the kitchen table, and I'll be like, my wife's like, are you even listening to me? I'm probably thinking about this pasta carbonara I had in Rome outside that. I swear to you. I swear to you. It's so weird. I don't know what it was to your omelet. Uh, there's something that just, like, kind of grabs you when you're having a meal. Maybe it's, like, the experience and the ambiance and just the timing. Maybe some of that, too. But... Yeah, if I'm ever in a daze or a curb looks at me and hits me like, hey, you awake, I'm probably thinking about that pop thing. <laughs> <laughs> Joey V, you are the best. We'll see you at the rink soon, and have a great weekend. Sounds great. Randy, Carey, and Brooke, you guys do the same, and I always enjoy these chats. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next week. All right, brother, take care. That's Joey V with us on 101 ESPN. We're going to head down the stretch with a little rock and roll. Stick around.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke. Ever since I moved here to St. Louis back in 2018, I really loved exploring my new home and thanks to the Metro, it's so much easier to do just that. I've lived in other cities that didn't provide public transportation and believe me, it led to a lot of congested traffic and made it harder to get to events like concerts and games, but that's why I love Metro Transit. It's easy to access for everyone, taking you right to Bush Stadium, City Park, Enterprise Center, and more without the hassle of parking, waiting in traffic, trying to find an Uber, just getting you straight into the action. Even if you haven't given Metro a try yet, it's something that I can promise you other places wish that they had available. There's many benefits even if you don't ride. A healthy and vibrant public transportation system helps attract businesses that help create a significant amount of jobs in the region. And of course, it helps many get to their job. Give Metro a chance and experience the benefits for yourself. Thanks to Metro, you don't have to drive to thrive. <laughs> had to step out the studio for him, and he would do something very important. He said he'll be right back, so I guess we'll we'll wait on his return. But Extremely right now we important. got we got what do we have? Rock's Hill to die on? Or are we doing rock no, and roll? No, no, we, we doing here. We got it. Well, which we're, one? Do we're we just have? doing rock and roll because yeah, we we, we, get, we did get a text. Boo. Somebody said, 314 said, do you guys still do Rock's Hill to Die On? I don't know why, but I enjoy when everyone yells at poor Rock. Um, yes, we, yes, we yes. Agreed with we you don't have that uh, because Rock's Hill to Die On is a special segment we do when we have to cover an extra hour well, we in have 10 a, to 11, and we don't have to do that as much anymore. Well, we should do, well, <laughs> I don't know how that happened because our, our normal hours were 7 to 11 for a while there. So, yeah, really so but like yeah, we, yeah we, we, we fought against that, <laughs> and, we, and we got back to normal. Okay, but Brooke wanted to bring something up. This is, this is a little... This has been talked about a lot on social media for the last, like, two weeks. Yes. But Brooke brought it up here today, and so I feel the need to bring it up. Uh, STL City's actually done great making a bunch of jokes about they, they keep posting pictures that say, we always think about him, and then it's Roman Berkey. Because a few weeks ago on the Internet, there was this thing that went around that said how that men think about the Roman Empire multiple times each week and women don't. And so that then created a social media thing mm -hmm. of women going to ask their husbands, significant others, boyfriends, friends, hey, coworkers even, hey, Hey, do, how often do you guys think about the Roman Empire? Brooke just brought that up to us in the studio. Uh, Carrie's da Carrie Davis's answer was at, at least once a week. And I was shocked. So at to, least at least once. So a week. to even explain this trend even more. So on TikTok now, women oh. are going around and asking men in their lives. They're saying, "How many times do you think about the Roman Empire?" And I thought that I thought that people were joking and <laughs> knew that the trend was going on. But then I just asked Carrie, and he was like, "Oh yeah, just about once a week." I'm at, like, at least. "What?" I don't like, know what? I'm at, I'm at like three. Why, so you just think. <laughs> My, well, one of my favorite movies is Gladiator, so I, okay. I think about uh, Maximus often and, and the trials and tribulations that he had to fight through <laughs> being a gladiator sold into... I mean, it, it, it's real in my life, Rock. It, it, was, it was a lot that he had to go through, they so I think the, about the Roman Colosseum, and it's a place that I would love to visit. They call him the Spaniard. Yeah, they did. <laughs> it, 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 wrong name. He was a guy that was fighting for his country, and they didn't know he was fighting for the country. <laughs> He was. He had to go through. Are eight. you a Spartacus fan too? Uh, nah, 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 that three hundred. That really. Well, three hundred's not Roman. Well, I, that, uh, Spartacus is. You know. I didn't. Okay. No. All right, fair I enough. didn't get into. That was a fun. I thought it was a fun show. I, oh, Spartan. No, I'd never seen it. Okay. Well, yeah, you should watch it if you love Roman. Uh, if you love. Uh, yeah, I'm at like three times I'm, a week. What about you, Randy? Never. 
Never. So you never think never. about it. Think no. about it. What did we get here? We got something. Uh, we got uh, from the, the chocolate rooster, the oh, greatest gooey butter cake God. that you'll ever have. This, this is, s'mores this is one. We, you got pumpkin spice there, this kids. Is, this is what we... Uh, <gasps> original apple, pumpkin, and Funny s'mores. Board, the original. Yeah. Pumpkin spice. Our favorite, Carrie. <laughs> yep. We, we mm-hmm. love pumpkin mm-hmm. spice. This is a... Yeah, the, the Roman Empire thing. I guess, what is something that you do think about randomly all the time? I think about sports. Time? I think about what I would do if I were in charge of the Cardinals and stuff like that. <laughs> do tell. You're one of the GMs that <laughs> Greg was talking about earlier. You know. Yeah, I tell you every day. No, <laughs> <laughs> you, the Holy <laughs> Trinity. Here's a, well, the Holy be. Trinity. Here's what I would do if I were in charge. I would surround myself. First of all, I know that I'm not exceptionally smart. I would surround myself with qualified people that are way smarter than I am. People that are capable of replacing me if somebody chooses to replace me. And I would bring in veteran people that know what a good player looks like Mm -hmm. because there's so many of those that have been passed out the door by other teams. And I I would, and by the way, it's not just baseball. I would do it in football, hockey, basketball, whatever. I I would surround myself with veteran people that know what championship players look like. Would you sign your young players to contracts before they got to uh, arbitration and then they became enemies of of each other? Yes, I would. Okay. Mm. Not every one of them, but the the ones ones that are going to be stars. Yeah, Yeah. 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 Alan Craig, Paul DeYoung. You know, (laughs) come on, Rob. Why do you do that? Why do you you, bring up relevant facts? Why does the negative? Why does how is that negative? Why is that dark cloud? How is that negative? Why why would you not want to sign the best RBI guy in the league for two years? I mean, you don't predict that he's going to mess up his foot in the World Series. Running around the base, tripping over a guy, falling over people. I'm just that's that's why teams are still nervous to do it. Is all I'm saying. Probably shouldn't have gotten what they did. Do do you not like where the Braves are right now? I do. Would you rather be in this market where the Braves are? I would rather be where the Braves are. Okay. Okay. Yes. Finally, positivity. Yeah. This is a breakthrough moment. This is a breakthrough moment. Would you like to talk about it? No, the other thing you can do if you choose (laughs) is is you could do like what the Yankees did in signing Giancarlo Stanton or trading for Giancarlo Stanton and giving Judge the huge money that they gave him and giving Anthony Rizzo the contract and Josh Donaldson the money. And Josh Donaldson is was batting like 124. When they cut him, he yeah. was making a lot of money, though. He sure was. No longer there, though. Uh, right. How would you like that? I wouldn't like that okay. very much at all. Look, look, I need to get a couple bets from you guys to okay, fill good. out this betting gonna, slip really wait, quickly. Are you going to go across the water and place this bet? Because don't ask me what I'm going to do. Don't, don't get out of my business. I, I, I got here. I got $18. Oh, you got 18, <laughs> oh, $18. <laughs> you really that, have exactly I, 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 I are you have $18. I literally have $18. I just have a you have more than Maryland Heights. I have just in there. had like $17. $18. $18 here. Just happen to have it in my pocket. You're going to go place a bet. We'll see. I got a busy day. Yeah, I, gotta, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta do the next show. I gotta, I gotta do a podcast. I gotta, I gotta long, a lot of stuff to do today. But anyhow, let's get to some of these bets really quickly. Let's start off with college football. An injured Mizzou is getting 13 and a half points. Minus 13 and a half for Mizzou. Vanderbilt plus 13 and a half. Are you feeling confident about an injured Missouri Tigers squad covering a two touchdown line? Ooh, touch, no, two touchdowns. Uh, Van, uh, Vanderbilt covers that. Really? It's like I think with the injuries, game. I think Vanderbilt's covering. They aren't injured. They'll play. Uh, how well do you play? How long do you play? How it, effective it, are you while you're playing? So you're taking Vandy. I'm taking, well, Van, I'm win, taking Vandy on the points. No, just, just, to like, just, to, just to cover that one. Uh, another uh, ranked matchup, it's going to be LSU, who's 13th versus number 20, Ole Miss. LSU, minus two and a half. They are, it's an away game for them, so you'd think it'd be more like a five and a half spread if it was a home game. Do you think LSU has a problem covering uh, by a field goal? I'd take Ole Miss. I was going to say, I'm going to take Ole Miss. Ole Miss, too. Yeah. At home? I am, I am too. Okay, then. I'm not fully yeah. bought on LSU. Two and a half, so you got to yeah. get a win by a field goal. They might well, win they, outright. Yeah. All right, you're taking, you're taking it with two. Okay, yeah. there it is. And then let's go with our final one here in college football. I really like this one. Number seven, Washington, who may by the end of the season be a top three team, is giving up 19 and a half to Arizona. Minus 19 and a half for Washington. That's minus 1,400, which is a super, super, super high number for minus 14, 19 and a half. So I'm taking my 19 and a half and running with it there against Arizona. It is in Arizona, by the way. Oh, take it. 
Michael Penix Jr. Yeah, only yeah. only three touchdowns. I'm think, three touchdowns all day for Washington. Take it. Yeah, I, think, I, I like that too. Yeah. I think they're severely underrated at seven right now. Let's switch over to the NFL. I really like this one. Just like last week when the Dolphins were were uh, minus six and a half versus the Broncos. I also like Ooh. this one. Dolphins are plus three against Ooh. the Buffalo Bills. They are in Buffalo, really? but it's not December. It's really? not like the passing game is going to be held back by the weather. How exactly are the Dolphins getting three? Take the Dolphins. Take the Dolphins all day. Yeah. Take them. I think they they probably win nope. that game. You taking Buffalo? Yeah, I'll take Buffalo. Wow, what? I think we're really? gonna have to go get you on that one, Randy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you think I Buffalo's gonna win that game? Buffalo at home? Yeah, they're gonna be, be no. Miami at home. Randy's dunking on us, on us if, if, no, if it happens. Her. You've got recency Prisoners bias of the going here, yeah. Prisoners <laughs> of the moment. Yeah. I mean, if you put up seventy against an NFL team, I'm gonna be <laughs> recently yeah. biased against yeah. any other team that they're playing against. I need you guys to pick one of these two unders: Steelers and Texans over under forty one and a half, or under. Rams and Colts over under forty five and a half. Take the Steelers and oh, ten or the Steelers oh. and the te- under forty one and a half. Under forty one and a half, Steelers and Texans. It is in Houston. Gardner, Min- Gardner Minshew for Indy rather than Anthony Richardson. 45 Steelers and, and the half. Steelers. Colton. 45. Rams. Colton is a ra- Colton Rams. 45 and a half. I okay. might take the Steelers and Texans. But C.J. Stroud scares me because he's going to yeah. he's gonna throw the ball. Well, you know what? Take the Steelers. Take the Steelers and Houston. Yeah, okay, fine. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll buy in. 41 and a half, though. So they're going to get after the 20 to 10? Yeah. 20 to yeah, 20, oh, 20, 2017. 20, yeah, 2017. 2017. Good. 2017. Okay, good. Uh, we're right. taking City because they're playing Sporting KC and they're getting plus odds, plus yeah. one ten for City to win that one. That is so our City. betting slip. Yep. There you go, Rock. Right. Good you job. Go. Yep. Thank you. Good job taking the right side of things uh, this time. By the way, into existence. Uh, we we've all we, we all love the uh, as you know the chocolate rooster gooey butter cakes. Our friend uh, Erica from the chocolate rooster is going to be out in Lake St. Louis tomorrow at the Lake St. Louis Farmers and Artists market at the meadows and she'll be set up early in the morning i think from eight to ten or eight to noon so stop on, on by and have uh, some of the chocolate rooster gooey butter cakes because they're sensational oh my god i just had it the is. apple one yeah. oh my god i'm trying to i got it good and good for you yeah. great job today <laughs> yeah they are that. it's good that's butter yeah, it's good. uh thanks <laughs> to our good. producer yeah. audio engineer the one the only matthew rocchio <laughs> pleasure uh brooke did you have fun yes how hey. about that camp wally haha Yes. I like that. I love Wally's. I love Wally's, too. Yes. It's great. Uh, Thank you, CD. Show us your face. We want to see your face. Who said that? You want to see my face? Good luck tomorrow against Hazelwood West. Thank you. You need it? Yeah, we do. We we need all the... Good luck, and All the good vibes we good can get. Vibes we can yes. Get. Hey, we thank you for tuning in, texting in, and being a part of the show for all of us until Monday morning at 7. Have a great weekend, St. Louis. That's right.